Welcome to the channel. If you've never been here before, this is Movie Readings, where I take entire Hollywood scripts and read them from start to finish right here on YouTube. Each of these takes hours to make, so it could really help me out if you leave a like and comment with the next movie reading you would like to hear. Thank you for listening, and enjoy The Fifth Element. We open on the Nile River, somewhere at the edge of the desert. Egypt, 1939. Omar and his mule zigzag along the bottom of sun-scorched dunes. The mule and the boy finally reach a temple excavation camp, a few tents dwarfed by a huge temple door jutting out of the sand. The camp is deserted, except for some kids by the temple entrance, holding large mirrors and reflecting light into the temple. Omar leaves his mule in the shadow. He seizes two goatskins and slips inside of the temple. Omar makes his way uneasily down a pillared corridor that opens into a vast room where an old scientist stands on a small wooden ladder. In front of the wall across the room, Professor Massimo Pacoli. A young man is beside him, Billy Masterson, age 25, an American student. He has a large sketch pad in his hands. Behind them, Aziz, age 10, whose job is to hold the last mirror which shines light into the expansive room. The Professor, deciphering. When the three planets are in eclipse, his fingers trace across the wall, which is covered with symbols and strange hieroglyphs as he deciphers. The black hole, like a door, is open. Evil comes, sowing terror and chaos. See, the snake, Billy, the ultimate evil. Make sure you get the snake. The professor points emphatically to the snake, the symbol of evil. Coming through the door between the three planets in eclipse, a close-up of Billy's hand sketching the snake quickly. He is a natural artist. And when is this door-opening snake act supposed to occur? The professor's fingers touch the signs. If this is the five, and this the thousand, he calculates, every five thousand years. Billy is kidding, so I have some time. He reaches for the pad. We angle on Omar, standing at the entrance to the chamber with the water bag, entranced by the sight. A skeletal hand falls on his shoulder. Omar turns to an ancient priest in a rough-milled black canic. I will take it to them, my son. Startled but obedient, Omar gives the water bag to the priest. Be with God, safe from evil. The priest makes the sign of the cross on the boy's forehead, dismissing him. As soon as he is gone, the priest turns a worried eye to the professor. The professor is back to translating, Billy to sketching. Then arrange the elements of life against the terror just so... His fingers run on. Water, fire, earth, air, four elements around the fifth. His fingers fall on the one element that has a human shape, surrounded by all the others. The priest opens the water skin and begins to pour a vial of powder onto the skin. Aziz is falling asleep. The mirror falls and the light fails. Aziz, light! The boy struggles to stay awake. The mirror comes up. Lord, forgive me. They already know too much in which all the history of the universe resides, all the strength, all the hope, protect us from evil. Amen. The professor turns to the priest who is pouring water into a tin cup from the skin. Father, it is the most extraordinary thing, the greatest find in history. Can you imagine the implications? Only too well. Here, you must be parched. He hands the cup to the professor. The professor takes it, has it almost to his lips, when... I mean, look, 
It is like a battle plan. In his excitement, he does not drink, much to the priest's chagrin. Hear the good and hear the evil. As the priest looks up, Aziz, the mirror boy, tips his mouth under the water skin, drinking the leakage. Here, he points to the five elements. A weapon against evil. Amazing, I'm going to be famous. Then let us toast your fame. Here, Billy. The priest hands Billy a cup. Drink. To fame. Salud. The professor raises the cup to drink. Then, We cannot toast with water. Billy, in my sack, the grappa. The priest watches, disconsolate, as the professor tosses away his water. Billy finishes his cup before running off into the tunnel. A muffled sound grows steadily louder. Outside, a monstrous linear shadow disturbs the kid's game and gradually darkens the temple's entrance. Billy is looking for the grappa in the professor's bag. He comes up with a machine pistol. When the muffled sound suddenly grabs his attention, he leans toward the corridor and sees part of a spaceship appear. Billy is paralyzed. The professor keeps reading over the inscription. This perfect person, this perfect being, ah, oh, I do not understand this. Perfect? Where is that boy? Billy? Billy presses himself against the wall in the shadows, terrified but sketching away like mad, as large shadowed figures lumber past him. He begins to blink, feeling the effects of the priest's potion. The professor reads the wall. And this divine light they talk about. What is the divine light? At that moment, the reflection from Aziz's mirror drops again and the light fails. Aziz, light! Without turning around. The room is suddenly flooded with light. Better? This is the most unbelievable thing I have ever seen! The professor turns around and is stunned, speechless, to find himself face to face with two Mondo Shawans. A dozen others fill the hall, manning the source of light. Large, luminous globes. Aziz is fast asleep. The professor uncomprehending. Uh, yes? The professor is lifted up and carried off to the side by the aliens. The commander stands in front of the priest, who is still on his knees, face to the ground. Master, he was about to discover everything, but I had the situation under control. The two Mondo Shawan guards hold the professor three feet off the ground. In a panic, Who are you? Are you Germans? Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Billy staggers forward, a machine pistol in his hand. The commander holds out his hand to the priest. What did I do wrong? The priest jumps to his feet excitedly. Servant, you and the thousand guards before you, you have done your work well, but we have to recover the elements. War will soon engulf your planet. We must keep them safe. The commander goes over to the wall and seems to be looking for a lock. He finds it and slides in his metallic finger, which is more intricate than a key to a safe. He turns his hand, activating a mechanism that opens the wall. Unbelievable! The commander turns around and crooks a finger. One of the Mondo Shawans waves his hand and puts the professor to sleep. He heads down the hallway, revealed by an opening. He is followed by his men, the priest slips in behind them. The commander steps into a vast room. The ceiling is very high and pyramid-shaped. In each corner of the room, four vessels contain four rectangular 12-inch stones, the four elements. In the middle, an opaque sarcophagus rests on an altar. The commander stops and contemplates at a moment. The priest, to himself, The fifth element! Take them, and put them in a safe place. His men carry out his orders. Billy staggers across the floor, struggling to stay awake. The commander opens a case. 
his men come and put the four precious stones in it one by one. The priest moved. Will the elements be gone now forever from this place? When mankind comes to its senses, we will return. Knowing mankind as I do, that could take centuries. Time is of no importance. Only life is important. The priest nods and lowers his eyes. Billy staggering forward, raising his pistol, blinking his eyes to focus. Amando Shawan puts the fourth element in the case. The commander shuts this case and looks at the priest. When evil returns, so shall we. The priest head lowered. We will be ready, Lord. Billy suddenly staggers into the room, brandishing his gun. Stop! Billy trips and the gun goes off. He empties the clip. The Mondo Shawan carrying the case crumples to the ground. The wall immediately begins to close. Billy fires wildly, unable to control the powerful kicking gun. No! Don't! The priest rushes Billy. The weapon has such a kick to it that Billy starts shooting into the air, backs up, and then stumbles and knocks himself out. The priest is on the ground, seriously wounded. So is the commander. The warriors are in a panic. Hurry! Commander! The wall is closing! The wall continues to close. Sand pours in from everywhere. The vast room fills up like an hourglass. A mission is a mission, Savoya. You'll learn that. The commander picks up the case and reaches the wall, but can't get through it. His armor is too bulky. The opening is too small. He manages to get his arm and the case through. My apologies to General Croy and my wife. The wall closes, crushing his arm. The clerk scoops up the case and runs through the huge piles of sand. The clerk boards the ship, carrying the case. Omar hides in the corner, frightened to death, hugging Billy's bag of drawings. The temple room fills with sand. The priest's body is soon buried. The huge ship's main hatch closes. The ship lifts off and speeds away. Omar emerges from the temple, gaping at the ship as it vanishes in the sky. A gigantic shooting star flashes above the pyramids. Looking down at Earth from orbit, the ship passes in front of us and heads for the stars, disappearing at unbelievable speed. The background is a star-speckled cosmos. 500 years later. Another, more modern spaceship fills the screen. A warship belonging to the Federal Army. A close-up of a digital control screen. Three planets projecting three straight lines that crisscross at one point, identical to the one observed by the professor on the temple wall. General Stadert looks out through the ship's window at one of the three huge planets in eclipse. Don't you have anything? Not even a temperature? The thermo analyzers have jammed. One of them reads over a million degrees, the other at minus 5,000. I've never seen anything like it. It's taking shape. In the middle of the shadows, a door to the nightmare has just opened. Evil is back. A round moving mass continually changing color. In awe. What the hell can it be? Hook up with the president in one minute, General. General Stadert remains calm. Send out a probe. Lindbergh. 50. The President of the United Federations, his features lined and worn by various delegations, mainly military, enters his office. There's a crisis in the air. The President's aide leans down to his ear. On air, 30 seconds. In the middle of the group is a priest whose appearance reminds us of Egypt. A younger man, David, 18, shy, a priest in training attends the old man. President's on the line, sir. 
General Stadert leans over his screen and seems surprised to see the room, but not the President. Stadert, do you read me? I can hear you, Mr. President, but I can't see you. The President grabs the mini camera on his desk and yanks it around to face him. His face fills the screen. The President, is that better? Perfect, Mr. President. I have to address the Supreme Council in ten minutes. Just the facts, General. There are no results from the chemical and molecular analyses as of yet. All of the calibers are overshot. We are hoping a thermonucleotic imaging, the President exasperated. What you are saying is you don't know what this thing is. Consternation reigns in the President's office. Not yet, sir. The only thing we know is it just keeps getting bigger. Options? Wait or act? Recommendations? My philosophy, Mr. President, is shoot first, ask questions later. I don't like uninvited guests. Gentlemen? I think it would be foolish to shoot at an organism that seems alive without first taking the time to study it more. Besides, it has shown no sign of hostility. The president worried. No, it just keeps getting bigger. So do people, but that's no reason to shoot them. The president exasperated. The security of the federated territories is and remains number one priority. I suppose General Stadert's philosophy is acceptable to you? All of the generals nod yes. All right then. Stadert? Mr. President. The President scans the room. Stadert remote controls the camera toward the room. Yes? The camera moves up the priest, and we finally discover his face. He's in his sixties, a shrewd look in his eye. Around his neck hangs the commander's finger, the key to the temple. Cornelius, Vito Cornelius, 50th level parish. I have a different theory to offer you, Mr. President. I'm listening. Imagine for a moment that this thing is not anything that can be identified, because it prefers not to be, because it is the antithesis of all we are, because it is evil, total evil. The President, a little more sarcastically, one more reason to shoot first, eh? All of the generals nod in agreement. Evil begets evil, Mr. President. Shooting would only make it stronger. The probe will obtain its objective in five seconds. Stadert moves closer to the ship's window. Evil swallows the probe and immediately bubbles over with activity, like a furious volcano. Mr. President, we are at crisis point. The President looks puzzled. Your theory is interesting, Father, but I don't think we have time to go into that right now. Time is of no importance, Mr. President. Only life is important. The President exasperated. That's exactly what we're going to try and do. Protect the lives of some 200 billion of our fellow citizens. General, you may fire when ready. Stadert coldly to the Captain. Up front loading of a 120 ZZR missile. Marker lights on the objective. All of the sudden, outside the ship, the strange planet's activity ceases. A black crust immediately covers it. The scientist, consulting new data. Its structure has just solidified on the surface, as if the object felt something. If that's the case, we are undoubtedly dealing with an intelligence the most terrible intelligence imaginable, Mr. President. The President hesitates. The ship is in combat formation. The missile is loaded, General. The President uneasy. Stater, give me a minute. I have a doubt. I don't, Mr. President. The missile explodes from the ship and penetrates its target. The explosion is swallowed like a fizzy pill in a small glass of water. Nothing happens, and then the mass grows larger. Stadert looks worried. Load a series of 740 missiles. Maximum shield protection. Yes, sir. 
the president is growing ever more worried. Stater, what's going on? Did you destroy it? I'm about to, Mr. President. A series of three missiles heads for the planet, which absorbs them all. It literally doubles in size. The planet's diameter has greatly increased. It's moving toward the ship. Statert, get out of there immediately. I don't want an incident. Do you hear me, Statert? Statert worried. What do we have that's bigger than a 240? Nothing, General. Statert, get out of there. That's an order. A bead of sweat pearls Statert's forehead. He's about to give an order when a gigantic flame emerges from the planet and literally swallows Statert's spaceship. His eyes wide. Good God! The flame fills the screen with a horrendous noise. It wakes up a man trying to escape from a nightmare in his apartment. Corbin Dallas rubs his head. Thirty-five years old, short hair, powerfully built, unquestionable charm, good-looking in spite of scars here and there. The alarm clock is still running. It shows the date as March 18, 2359. It's two in the morning. He grabs a cigarette and stops to look for a light. He shuts off the alarm. He hears a cat meowing in the hall, but it still rings. Corbin takes a moment and realizes it is in the phone that is ringing. To the cat, I'm coming. He grabs the phone and crosses his tiny apartment, 27 feet long by 6 feet wide, heading for the door, patting himself for a light. Behind him, the bed makes itself automatically. On the phone, yeah? Hey, bud. Finger here. He opens the door for the cat and starts to rummage through a drawer for a match. Out comes a handful of war decorations, a hero's collection. Hey, sweetie, to the cat. A Medal of Honor certificate to Major Dallas. Yeah, I love you too, Major. But you haven't called me that since basic training. I was talking to the cat. Oh yeah, I forgot, you still prefer your cat to the real thing. A picture of Corbin and his ex-wife on their wedding day. At least the cat comes back. Finger, ironically. You still pining for that two-timing bitch? Forget her. There are a million women out there. I don't want a million. I just want one. A perfect one. Don't exist, bud. A picture of Corbin and Finger in uniform next to a space fighter. I just found a picture of you. How do I look? Like shit. Corbin finds a box of matches with three matches. He strikes one. It doesn't light. Corbin opens the fridge, bare, except for an empty can of Gemini croquettes. In the packet is an ad. Win a dream trip for two to Floston Paradise. Must be an old picture. Listen, you gotta bring me your hack for a six-month overhaul. ASAP. Corbin heats up some brackish water. I don't need one. You're forgetting who sat next to you for a thousand missions. I know how you drive. Finger, I'm driving a cab now, not a space fighter. How many points you got left on your license? Corbin, lying. Uh, at least fifty. In your dreams... See you tonight. Finger has hung up. Corbin sighs and does the same. He gets the heated brackish water and sits down. The cat pounces on the table and meows for its food. Corbin pours half the coffee in the cat's cup. The cat meows and Corbin taps his cup to the cat's saucer. Cheers! The president's office is emptied. Only a few army officers remain. An ancient manuscript, Billy's Drawings, sits in front of the president. Cornelius turns page after page, illustrating his point. We have 48 hours, the time it needs to adapt itself to our living conditions. The president worried. Then what? And then it will be too late. The goal of evil is to wipe out life, all forms of life, for all eternity. Life upsets it. The president appears upset himself by this image. 
Is there anything that can stop it? Yes, thank God. The Mondo Shawan ship bursts through a star cluster and fills the screen. The manuscript is open on the president's desk. We see a close-up of Billy's rendering of the Mondo Shawan. Cornelius to the president. The Mondo Shawans don't belong to the Federated Territories, but they are peaceful. In their possession are the four elements of life. These elements, when they are gathered around a fifth, the supreme being, ultimate warrior, created to protect life. The supreme being is standing as if frozen in armor. All we see is the bottom half of his body. Big metallic gloves hold the case engraved with the emblem of the three suns containing the four sacred stones. We'll produce what the ancients called the light of creation, the light of total goodness, which is the only thing that can defeat evil. The president points to the spot occupied by the fifth element. But what happens if, instead of this, ultimate warrior, it is evil who stands there? White turns to black, light to dark, life to death, for all eternity. The president's nerves quiver. Sir, we have a Mondo Shawan spaceship at Frontier, requesting permission to enter our territory. I guess I should make a decision. They are the only ones who can help. Sir, the Mondo Shawan do not belong to the Federation. We do not know their intention. I must recommend the tri-nuclear assault. The president yells. Did you see that thing? Swallow our battleship like a gumdrop? You can't even tell me what that is. I ask you for options. You give me bullshit. Give them permission to enter our territories. With my warmest regards. Cornelius is relieved. Thank you, Mr. President. The Mondoshawan spaceship zips across the Federated Galaxy, but it is not alone. Two black warships seem to be dogging it. The Mondoshawans have spotted the spacecraft chasing them. Two non-identified ships approaching. Must be the welcoming committee. A Mangalore sits at the controls of the warship. His terrifying features tell us what sort of welcome they can expect. The pilot fires without warning. The ship is hit badly and immediately swerves off course. Panic aboard the Mondashawan ship. We've been hit. General alert. Blast after blast hits the defenseless ship. We are losing control. We have to land fast. The huge ship veers off course and heads for a small red planet, taking hit after hit. Sending out distress signal, activate the emergency landing procedure. The huge ship approaches the planet at blinding speed. Impact in less than ten seconds. The red planet looms even closer. Time is of no importance. The ship crashes in a gigantic explosion. A thermonuclear explosion fills a TV screen back in Corbin's apartment. His cat is watching with interest. Corbin is about to leave. Don't watch it all day. It'll rot your mind. Bye, sweetie. In response, the cat meows. Corbin opens the door to a huge gun brandished by a nervous mugger pointing right at his face. The cash, man! Been here long? Don't fuck with me, man, or I'll blow you into tomorrow. Unperturbed, Corbin looks at the mugger's fearsome weapon. Is that a Z-140? Alleviated titanium. Neurocharged assault model? The mugger off balance. Uh, you know, you could hurt someone with this puppy. Good thing it's not loaded. The mugger is lost. He looks at his weapon. It's not? You gotta push the little yellow button. Corbin points to the button on the side of the gun. The mugger takes his advice. Hey, thanks. You're welcome. And with lightning speed, Corbin blasts the mugger with a straight right hand, sending him down for the count. Corbin retrieves the gun. You know these things are very illegal. You could get in a shitload of trouble. I better hang on to it for you. As the mugger clears his head, 
Corbin opens a drawer next to him, which is full of similar guns. The mugger's eyes pop out of his head. He scampers to his feet and runs off. Corbin shrugs and exits his apartment, closes the door. The cat watches a nuclear holocaust on TV, uninterrupted. Corbin enters his taxi. A robotic voice greets him. Please enter your license. Corbin complies and starts to push a series of buttons on the dash. Welcome on board, Mr. Dallas. How are you doing this morning? Sleep okay? I didn't. Corbin hits a button and the garage door starts to open. Fuel level 6.03. Propulsion 2 by 4 I had the worst goddamn nightmare. You have nine points left on your license. Thanks for reminding me. As the garage door lifts, the megalopolis that is New York City in the 23rd century comes into view, startling in its height and breadth. Have a nice day. Corbin lets the propulsion build. Right. He lets the gear slip and the taxi rockets off into the city. In the president's office, Cornelius collapses in a chair. We are lost. Mr. President, the attack was launched by two unregistered warships. Close all borders and declare a state of general alert. Yes, sir. The president to another officer. Try to contact those Montechalans. We owe them an explanation. Cornelius, lost. What are we going to do? This is government business now. You ought to go home and get some rest, father. The president motions to his guards to come and get Cornelius. I promise to keep you informed. A weary Cornelius leaves the room with David's help. The president, to the captain. Has the rescue team found any survivors? An arm on a surgical cart moves down the hall of the nucleological center the most sterile of environments. Professor Machtelberg, age 60, hurries alongside General Monroe. Is that all that survived? Actually, only one cell survived. Have you identified it? It's not that easy. We've never encountered anything like it before. You see, normal human beings have a 40 DNA memo group, which is more than enough for any species to perpetuate itself. This one has 200,000. Talk English, Doc. The cell is like a huge library. It has infinite genetic knowledge stored inside, almost like it was engineered. Sounds like a freak of nature to me. Yes, I can't wait to meet him. They pass into the lab. The two enter a cylindrical laboratory. There's a huge glass turbine in the middle, with the metal glove inside. A DNA chain scrolls on the computer screen. Machtelberg, rather fascinated. The compositional elements of his DNA are the same as ours. They are simply more of them, and tightly packed. His knowledge is probably limitless. Monroe worried. Is there any danger? Some kind of virus? We put it through the cellular hygiene detector. The cell is, for lack of a better word, perfect. Monroe hesitates a moment. Then he sighs and uses his personal key to open the self-destruct box. Okay, go ahead. But Mr. Perfect better be polite. Otherwise, I turn him into cat food. Machtelberg starts the operation rolling as Monroe puts his hand on the self-destruct button, ready to use it. Thousands of cells form in the heart of the generator, an assemblage of DNA elements. Then the cells move down a tube like a fluid and gather in an imprint of a human body. Step by step, bones are reconstructed. Then the nervous and muscular systems, whole veins wrap around the muscles. An entire body is reconstructing before our very eyes. Three seconds to ultraviolet protection. A shield comes over the reconstructing body and makes it invisible. This is a crucial phase. The reconstruction of pigment. 
cells are bombarded with slightly greasy solar atoms, which force the body cells to react and to protect themselves. That means growing skin. Clever, eh? Monroe is disgusted. Eh, yeah, wonderful. The meter slows and drops to zero. End of reconstruction. Beginning of reanimation. A whoosh of air in the glass chamber. Captain Monroe has his hand on the self-destruct button, ready to destroy the being that has been barely reborn. Magdalberg pushes a button. Activate life support system. An electrical discharge fills the glass chamber, causing the body inside to jerk. After a few moments of silence, the sound of a heartbeat fills the room over the loudspeaker. Life support system activated. The supreme being is alive once again. Remove the shield. The assistant automatically removes the ultraviolet shield, which slowly reveals a woman, nude, young, and very beautiful. Monroe stands there gaping, not quite his vision of the supreme being. Magdalberg glances at Monroe and gently pushes his hand away from the self-destruct button. I told you! Perfect! Monroe is hypnotized by the girl's beauty. I'd, uh, like to get a few pictures before she wakes up for the archives. Magdalberg looks at him with a grin. A remote control camera approaches the girl's face. A flash goes off. Blinded by the flash, the girl jumps and screams. She cowers in a corner, shaking from the cold, darting eyes everywhere, looking for the case she was holding. The girl is very angry. Ukra kocho adomaya banai okra mokocho ferji akba lengula makadikre orbata tokemata tokemata sino santona ayapa minwa acheba givoma neseno Monroe worried what's she saying activate the phonic detector the girl kicks the window repeatedly and give her a light sedative something to wear as well the assistant hits a button. A pile of clothes drop out of a trap door in the ceiling. She snatches them up angrily and dresses quickly. Monroe draws closer to the glass window. He watches her dress with undisguised pleasure. Is this thing solid? Magdeburg smiles. An elephant couldn't crack it. The girl finishes dressing. Monroe smiles safely behind his plate glass window. You're going to have to learn to communicate better than that, Angel, if you want out. Monroe dangles the key on a chain that will let her out. The girl rams her fist through the window. She grabs the key and yanks it. The chain snaps tight and Monroe slams into the window, knocking himself out. The girl puts her hand through the window again, unlocks the chamber, and steps out. She's still a bit wobbly on her legs. The two guards try to grab her. She sends them flying across the room. Magdalberg is most impressed. He sets off a general alarm. The girl runs through a maze of corridors looking for a way out. A squad of security guards appear in front of her and open fire without warning. The girl takes a leap grabs an air vent, kicks it out, and dives into the air shaft. The cops try to jump into the vent, but none can reach it. Get me a chair, or a stepladder. The rest of you, go through the main ventilation. The girl moves along, unable to see what's ahead of her. She comes to a dead end, a grill that leads outside. She pushes it out, and exits onto a ledge. She has exited to the ledge of the 450th floor of a building, right in the middle of Manhattan, which we discover for the first time. The city has become monstrous. Buildings rise 600 stories. Cars fly. Subways run vertically. The girl edges along the narrow ledge, unfazed by the height. The chief leans out the vent, looking out into the void. To his men, Go on! Follow her! The cops stare into the gaping void. Huh, no way! The chief angrily pulls out his gun and shoots at the girl, who
who ducks around the corner of the building. Unfortunately, the other side is full of cops as well. A flying police car zooms up in front of her, sirens blaring. This is the police. Your status is illegal. Please put up your hands and follow our instructions. The girl feels trapped. She looks down into the endless 450 stories below and all the cars flying underneath. Then she raises her arms and dives off. Christ, she dove off! In a panic, the cop makes a wrong turn. The girl falls for several seconds. She lands on the roof of a flying cab. Corbin tries to control his car, reeling from the impact. You have just had an accident. Seven points have been temporarily removed. Corbin manages to stop his cab and pull over to the side. You have one point left on your license. Have a good day. Corbin sighs and looks in the back seat to see what the damages are. The girl, a bit dazed, who wouldn't be, emerges from the debris and sits up. There's some blood on her face. Corbin is stunned. The girl is still alive and so beautiful. His heart heads for a meltdown. Akina de Lutan no Shan. Corbin is lost. Excuse me? A police car with wailing sirens halts in front of Corbin, over the loudspeaker. You have an unauthorized passenger in your vehicle. We are going to arrest her. Please leave your hands on the wheel. Thank you for your cooperation. Corbin obeys. Sorry, hon, but I only got one point left on my license. I gotta get to the garage. The police car presses up against the cab. The doors slide open. Huge guns point at her. Corbin feels lousy. The girl, helpless, tears in her eyes. She looks exhausted. Corbin glances at her in the rearview mirror. She's looking all around to find something to help her communicate with him. An ad on the back of the seat. An 800 number to help an orphanage. A teary photo of a kid over the words, Please help. She shoots to Corbin a look of pure distress. Please help? Corbin can't resist her plea. Don't put me in this position. I can't. I'm late as it is. But he cannot say no to her eyes. Finger's gonna kill me. Corbin shuts off the meter and floors it, sideswiping the police car as he roars away. Your license has been revoked. Would you please? Corbin whips out a gun and shatters the loudspeaker. I hate when people cry. I got no defense. The police car takes off after him, sirens screeching. An insane chase ensues. Corbin and his flying taxis are absolute masters of the air. The cops have trouble following him, but then another cop car comes to join in the fun. Corbin drives like a man possessed. Nothing can stop him, except the dead end that he's just come up against. There's only one thing I don't need advice on, and it's how to drive. Corbin turns his cab sideways and scrapes through a narrow passageway, ripping his taxi light from the roof. The police car smashes into the wall. The other one breaks just in time. Shit! Attention, all patrol cars! The car makes a U-turn, looking for a wider passageway. The police car roars up, sirens screaming, then slows down and checks out a dead end, flanked by a large vertical neon billboard. The dead end is empty. Corbin's cab is hidden vertically behind the billboard. Seeing nothing... The police drive away. We'll wait until things quiet down a bit. You mind? The girl grabs his shirt collar and pulls him close, whispering in his ear. Priest, you're not that bad. Come on, we'll get you to a doctor. The girl hands him the handle of the case with the three Egyptian sons. The girl, weak. Vito Cornelius, priest. Vito Cornelius? The girl nods and then faints. Corbin is somewhat lost, faced with so much mystery. The door of Cornelius's apartment opens. 
Corbin is there, with the unconscious girl in his arms. Corbin, embarrassed. Excuse me? I'm looking for a priest? Cornelius, tired. Weddings are one floor down. Congratulations. Cornelius closes the door, and the doorbell rings again. She's not my bride. She's my fair. She's looking for Vito Cornelius. According to the phone guide, he lives here. Cornelius, curious. That's me, but I don't know who she is. How did you find her? She dropped in on me, holding this. Corbin hands him the metal handle with the three Egyptian sons stamped on it. Cornelius staggered. The fifth element! He faints dead away. Corbin, with the girl still in his arms, looks around, helpless. Finger's gonna kill me. In his armchair, Cornelius gets woken up by a slap in the face. Who, who are you? I brought the girl, remember? The girl? Cornelius gets up. He looks at the handle. Yeah, she dropped in on me. I mean, on, on my taxi. Talking this bizarre language. And then it dawns on Cornelius who the girl is. Eyes riveted on her. He is a she? Oh, you noticed. Face shining. There's not a moment to lose. Wake her up, but be gentle about it. This woman is mankind's most precious possession. She is perfect. So you do know her. Uh, yes, we are cousins, distant cousins. Cornelius runs into the next room. Corbin looks at the girl, goes to slap her, and then changes his mind. Her beauty troubles him. He hesitates, then gently caresses her cheek. Her skin seems so soft and so fragile. Perfect. David, mending a cassock, when Cornelius bursts into the room out of breath. It's a miracle! What is it? Cornelius babbling crazily. I can't wear these clothes. This calls for dignity. I have to dress the part. He opens a closet filled with identical robes and plunges in, disappearing, as David looks on, uncomprehending. Corbin gently kisses the girl's cheek, but she doesn't respond. He looks around, then kisses her on the lips. The girl's eyes snap open. When Corbin straightens up, he discovers his own gun jammed under his chin. Echo atka gamat. Corbin, embarrassed. I I'm sorry, it's just that uh, I was told to wake you up gently, so I figured... The girl pauses a moment. She stares at him, looking puzzled. You're right, I was wrong. I shouldn't have kissed you, especially since we haven't been formally introduced, and... Uh, he pulls out a business card. Here, it's a bit late, but... My name is Corbin. Corbin Dallas? Keep it. You never know. Maybe you'll need a cab one day. And I'll be happy to open the door this time. The girl hesitates and snatches the card like a wild animal. Cornelius is lost in the closet. Father, will you please explain what's going on? The Supreme Being! The Fifth Element is here. In our parish. It's a miracle. What's your name? After a moment, Lilo Manai La Caraba Manama Chai Ekabat de Sabat. Corbin, polite. Hey, that's, uh, cute. Do you have a nickname? Something a little shorter? Lilo. Corbin is clearly falling in love. That's really cute. Cornelius bursts into the room. She turns the gun on him. He bows before her. Apipulai Lilo Menai. Cornelius? Cornelius bowing. At your service. Lilo lowers her guard and starts to laugh. An irresistible childish laugh. Corbin smiles. Father, you are sure she's the supreme being? Absolutely sure. There's the triple suns on her gloves. David bows low, but his eyes glance up at Lilo. Cornelius begins to lead Corbin toward the door, hustling him out. They all like this in your family, father? She's an exception. And thank you for your help, Mr... Dallas. Corbin Dallas. 
Cornelius takes his arm. Lilo stops laughing when she sees that Corbin is leaving. Yes, that's fine. Thank you very much. A thousand times over. I might call to check up on her, you know, to see if she's better. She's fine, really, don't you worry. She just needs some rest. She's had a very long trip. I know, I was there when she arrived. Cornelius is about to open the door. Corbin's hand blocks it. Excuse me, just one more thing. She said something to me a little while ago. I don't really get it. Atka gamat? It means never without my permission. That's what I thought. Cornelius slams the door in his face. Thanks. Corbin beads down the hallway of his apartment. He passes his neighbor. Evening. Fuck you. Thanks, you too. Corbin enters his apartment. The door slides back and the cat comes rubbing up against him, tail in the air. Oh god, I forgot your food. I'm really sorry. How about some nice Thai nosh to apologize? How's that sound, huh? The cat meows, appeased, just as the phone rings. Hello? Hey, bud, I've been waiting here all day. Finger, man, I'm sorry. Listen, I was on the way over, but I had a fare that fell into my lap. You know one of those big fares you just can't resist? So, how big was this fare? Five, seven, green eyes, long legs, great skin, perfect. Corbin takes out a cigarette. Uh-huh. I don't suppose you got the name of this perfect fair. Lilo. Lilo has a towel wrapped around her. It looks like she just took a shower. She sits in front of a computer, wolfing down chicken. Data scrolls by on the screen. David watches from the corner in awe. What is she doing? Learning our history. The last 5,000 years that she's missed. She's been out of circulation a while, you know. Lilo breaks into childish laughter. What are you laughing about? Lilo, pronouncing it badly. Napoleon Small. She laughs again and tosses some capsules into the microwave. David, hesitant. Uh, Father, I know she's been through a lot, but the sacred stones... We don't have much time. Yes, of course. Lilo takes her plate out of the microwave. A steaming plate heaped with chicken and exotic vegetables. Lilo, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but... She sits back down in front of the screen and chomps away heavily on her second chicken. Cornelius sits opposite her, holds up the case handle. The case, with the stones, where is it? San Agamat Chai Bet Envolet. The case was stolen? Lilo nods her head, quite unperturbed, and continues to devour the food in front of her. Cornelius is shocked. Who in God's name would do such a thing? A pair of feet limping heavily in Zorg's warehouse. A man comes alongside them. Excuse me, sir. The council is worried about the economy heating up. They wondered if it would be possible to fire 500. They reach the door at the end of the corridor. Zorg enters a code. Fire 1000. But 500 is all they need, sir. Zorg turns slowly. A small scar runs across his face. His eye stutters. This is not a man to cross or contradict. A thousand. Fine, sir. Sorry to have disturbed you. The door opens to Cornelius' apartment, and David enters, carrying a bundle of clothes. There was a guy with a limp who came a month ago, said he was an art dealer, asking all these questions about the sacred stones. At the time, I didn't think anything of it. What was his name? I'm so bad with names. David to Lilo. I didn't know your size. Lilo is happy. She pulls off the towel and stands there nude. Cornelius and David turn away. They really made her... Perfect. Lilo finishes dressing. She's delighted. Domo Danko. David smiles, dumb with admiration. Cornelius comes over. Lilo, 
The stones. We must get them back. Lilo settles down, sits at the computer, and turns it on. Ikset ikba. Mi amanataba um dalat. You know exactly where they are. A group of handsome warriors approaches. Aknot, their leader, has the sacred case in their hands. The metal handle is missing, but the second metal glove is still grasping the case. Zorg, pretending to be worried. Aknot, is that you? The leader nods. A disgusted look stamps Zorg's features. What an ugly face. It doesn't suit you at all. Take it off. Aknot's face burns away to reveal the head of a monstrous Mangalore. That's better. Never be ashamed of who you are. You're warriors, so be proud. Aknot says nothing, but if his eyes could talk. So what if the Federal Army crushed your entire race and scattered your people to the wind? Your time for revenge is at hand. Voila, the ZF-1. He takes out a weapon from a crate and goes into a sales pitch. It's light, the handle's adjustable for easy carrying, good for righties and lefties. Meanwhile, two men set up a mannequin rigged with various defense mechanisms at the far end of the warehouse. It breaks down into four parts, undetectable by x-rays. It's the ideal weapon for quick, discreet interventions. A word on firepower? Titanium recharger. 3,000 round clip with bursts of 3 to 300. With the replay button, another Zorg innovation. It's even easier. One shot. He fires at the mannequin. And replay sends every following shot to the exact same location. Zorg spins around. The rounds all hit the mannequin. Now even faster. I recharge, but the enemy has launched a cowardly sneak attack from behind. The auto mirror takes care of that. Give me the time to turn around and finish the job. 300 round bursts, and then are the Zorg Olis. He fires off each item he names. The rocket launcher, the always efficient flamethrower, my favorite, and our famous net launcher, the arrow launcher, with exploding or poisonous gas heads. Very practical. And for the grand finale, the all-new ice cube system. The mannequin has been blasted into a pile of ashes, covered by a net, stuck with arrows. The whole mess is frozen solid. He tosses the weapon into Aknot's hand. Four full crates, delivered right on time. What about you, my dear Aknot? Did you bring me what I asked for? Aknot sets the case on the crate. Zorg gloats while stroking the case. Magnificent. Zorg smiles, taking a deep breath, and opens the case. It's empty. Lilo breaks into her childish laughter once again. What do you mean, empty? Aknot looks into the case. Things grow tense. All right, I've got an open mind here. Anyone care to explain? Lilo explains what happened in her language. Cornelius translates. She says that the Guardians never really had much faith in humans. They were afraid of being attacked. The stones were given to someone they could trust who took another route. She's supposed to contact this person in a little less than 12 hours from now in a hotel. She's looking for the address. A map of the stars flashes onto the screen and Lilo points. Dot! The little group comes over to look. Planet Falston in the Angel Constellation. Cornelius plops down in his armchair. We're saved! I'm fucked! Zorg calmly closes the case and gives Aknot a blood-chilling stare. You asked for the case. We brought you a case. Zorg shouting, A case with four stones in it! Not one, not two, or three, but four! Four stones! What am I supposed to do with an empty case? Aknot's men grow edgy. Aknot tense. We are warriors, not merchants. Zorg is humored. But you can still count. Look at my fingers. He holds up four fingers. Four stones, four crates. 
zero stones, zero crates, to his men. Put everything back. We're out of here. Aknot's warriors turn their weapons on Zorg. Aknot icily. We risked our lives. I believe a little compensation is in order. Smiling. So you are a merchant after all. To his men. Leave them one crate. For the cause. Zorg's men leave a crate and exit with the other three. Zorg walks along the street to his limo. His right arm carries the empty case. I don't like warriors. They're too narrow-minded, no subtlety. Worse, they fight for hopeless causes. For honor. Honor has killed millions of people, but hasn't saved a single one. You know what? I do like a killer. A real dyed-in-wool killer. Cold-blooded, clean, methodical, thorough. A killer, when he picked up the ZF-1, would have immediately asked about the little red button on the bottom of the gun. The warriors have all taken a weapon. One of them inspects his ZF-1. He turns it over and notices the little red button and presses it. An ear-shattering explosion levels the warehouse. Zorg, impassive. Bring the priest. Corbin is finishing a Thai meal cooked by a Thai on his mini-restaurant, anchored at the window. The cat eats next to Corbin, contented. So you forgive me. The cat meows just as the red light blinks, announcing the arrival of a message in a glass tube. Corbin ignores it. Not going to open? I've never gotten a message that wasn't bad news. How someone strong like you scared for message? Is good news, I sure. The last two messages I got, the first one is from my wife telling me that she was leaving. The second was from my lawyer telling me that he was leaving. With my wife. You're right, that's bad. But mathematically, luck must change. Grandfathers say it never rain every day. This is good news, guarantee. I bet you lunch. Corbin hesitates, then gives the envelope to the tie who opens it with a big smile that fades, as he reads the contents aloud. You're fired. Oh. Corbin smiles at him. At least I won lunch. Good philosophy. See good in bad. I prepare number one dessert, special for you and pussy. The cat meows. Lilo is polishing off an immense pile of dessert as David bangs away at the computer. I got it. Everything here we need to know about Floston Paradise Hotel, and a detailed blueprint of the entire hotel. Good work, my son. Now all we need is a way to get there. The doorbell rings. I'll get it. Finish your work, my son. Cornelius opens to right arm with armed escort. Father Cornelius? My son? Mr. Zorg would like a word with you. Mr. Who? Zorg turns to Cornelius in his office. Zorg, Jean-Baptiste Emmanuel Zorg. Nice to meet you again. I remember you now, the so-called art dealer. I'm glad you got your memory back, father, because you're going to need it. Where are the stones? Why on earth do the stones interest you? Personally, they're of no interest to me. I'd rather sell weapons. But I have a customer, so tell me. Even if I did know where the stones were, I would never tell someone like you. Why, what's wrong with me? I'm a priest. I'm here to serve life. All you want to do is destroy it. Ah, oh, Father, you are so wrong. Let me explain. Zorg leads Cornelius into his inner office. Would you like a drink? No, thank you. Follow me. Life which you nobly serve comes from destruction. Look at this empty glass. Zorg pushes the glass with his finger. Here it is, peaceful, serene. But if it is... Zorg pushes the glass off the table. It shatters on the floor. Destroyed. Small individual robots, both freewheeling and integrated, come zipping out to clean up the mess. Look at all of these little things, so busy all of a sudden. 
Notice how each one is useful. What a lovely ballet. So full of form and color. So full of life. They are robots. A servant comes and pours water in another glass. Zorg tosses a cherry into it. Yes, but that simple gesture of destruction, I gave work to at least 50 people today. The engineers, technicians, mechanics. 50 people who will be able to feed their children so they can grow up big and strong. Children who have children of their own, adding to the great cycle of life. Cornelius sits in silence. Father, by creating a little destruction, I am, in fact, encouraging life. So in reality, you and I are in the same business. Destroying a glass is one thing. Killing people with the weapons you produce is quite another. Let me reassure you, Father. I will never kill more people in my entire life than religion has killed in the last 2,000 years. Zorg smiles, holding up the glass and takes a drink. Unfortunately, he chokes on the cherry. Unable to breathe, Zorg starts to panic. Cornelius mocks. Where is the robot to pat your back? Zorg falls, writhing on his desk, inadvertently hitting buttons which trigger a slew of little mechanisms. They pop out all over the desk. True chaos reigns. Even a cage appears, holding a Suleiman Akhtapan, a fat, multicolored beast, Picasso, who seems surprised to be out in daylight. He licks his half-dead master in thanks. Cornelius gets up and walks around the desk. Zorg motions for help. Can I give you a hand? Cornelius whacks him on the back and the cherry comes flying out. Zorg regains control of himself and guards come running in. You saved my life, so I'm going to spare yours. To the guards, throw him out! The guards throw Cornelius out. You are a monster, Zorg. Zorg is complimented. I know. The guards drag Cornelius out of the office. Torture whoever you want. The president, if you have to. But I want those stones. You have an hour. Right arm salutes and hurries out of the office. The dark planet. Three warships are positioned in front of it. Communication satellites arrive from all over the place, drawn to it like a magnet. The captain, observing. It's gobbling up all the communication satellites in the galaxy. President Lindbergh seems even more crushed by the recent events. Why the hell is it eating up all those satellites like that? The head scientist, desperate. We are working on it, Mr. President. We're working on it. It should only choke on them. Monroe enters the office just as a cockroach crawls onto the desk. There's a small antenna on its back. Zorg's right arm wears earphones, monitoring the president's conversation with the cockroach spy. I managed to contract the Mondeshawan. They deplore the incident, but accept our apologies. The president is relieved. And the stones? Did you find them in the wreckage? The stones weren't aboard the ship. The president, surprised. What do you mean? The president is all ears. So is Zorg's right arm. The Mondeshawan never fully trusted the human race. They felt we were too unpredictable. So they gave the stones to somebody they do trust. Her name is Plava Laguna. She's a diva. She's going to sing at the charity ball on Flost in Paradise in a few hours. She has the stones with her. The president breathes easier. Zorg's right arm is delighted. The president taking off a shoe. Excellent. He crushes the cockroach with the shoe. Right arm's earphones fly off his head. Goodbye, eardrums. I want your best men on this. Don't worry, sir. I have the perfect one. Back in Corbin's apartment, we get a close-up of the most disgusting dessert ever made. Corbin looks at it, shimmying on a plate. 
as the Thai serves it to him proudly. Stewed jellyfish cake, my specialty. Corbin forces a weak, polite smile as the Thai looks on expectantly. The phone rings. Saved by the bell. Corbin rises to get his cigarettes and answer the phone. Hello? You're the nastiest dirtbag I know in this stinking city. Corbin resigned. Hi, Ma. I've been playing twice a week for 20 years. 20 years I've been eating those shitty croquettes. Corbin goes to light his cigarette. There are only two matches left in the matchbox. Corbin strikes one and it fizzles. You wouldn't even eat one to help your old ma. And you win the big prize? You know something? The whole thing makes me sick. The tie starts to clean up, just as Corbin goes to strike the second match. Are you listening to me, you ingrate? Yes, ma. Corbin sighs and puts the match back in the box. He enters his code on the keypad the tie is holding. Go on. This is going to take a while. The tie casts off. Corbin closes the window. Other than that, you're all right? And now you're making fun of me? I'm warning you. If you don't take me after all these years of sacrifice, I'll never forgive you. The tie flies off. In the hall, the cat meows for more food. I'm coming. Ma, what are you talking about? I get it. You want to make me beg, is that it? All I want is an explanation. I just got in, I lost my job, I smashed my cab, I got mugged. But other than that, everything's peachy, Ma, thanks for asking. Now settle down and explain to me, calmly. A message drops in his tube. The red light goes on. You just want a trip, you dolt. Ten days in Floston Paradise for two? Ma, if I won that, I'd know about it. Somebody would have notified me. They've been blaring out your name on the radio for the last hour, you blockhead. He eyeballs the message, still in the tube. The doorbell rings. Ma, it's the door. I'll call you back. Corbin hangs up before his mother can say anything and heads for the door. It opens, and General Monroe enters, followed by the captain and the major. Major Iceborg is a woman. All she needs to become a man is a mustache. Monroe opens a file. Major Dallas, if our calculations are correct, you still have 57 hours owed to the Federal Army on your enlistment, which is more than you will need for a mission of the utmost importance. What mission? To save the world. Where have I heard this song before? You're to leave immediately for Floston Paradise. Retrieve four stones from the Diva Plava Laguna and bring them back with the utmost discretion as possible. Any questions? Corbin looking bewildered. Just one. Why me? Three reasons. One, as part of the elite special forces unit of the Federated Army, you are an expert in the use of all weapons and spacecraft needed for this mission. Monroe pulls out a long list of documents. Two, of all the members of your unit, you were the most highly decorated. And the third one? You're the only one left alive. Monroe removes the message Corbin hasn't bothered to look at. Don't you open your messages? I've had enough good news for today. You have won the annual Gemini Contest and a trip to Floston Paradise for two. Congratulations, here are your tickets. He hands Corbin the tickets, and Corbin gets it. You rigged the contest? Monroe nods. Major Iceborg will accompany you, as your wife. The idea of making a trip with Iceborg makes him sick. You couldn't come up with something a little more discreet? Old tricks are the best tricks, eh? I'm not going. Why not? One reason. I want to stay the only one left alive. Lilo and Cornelius search for Corbin's apartment. Lilo carries the card Corbin gave her. Corbin finds the apartment and yanks the number off the door. He waves Lilo over as his hand goes to the bell. The doorbell rings. Excuse me. Corbin goes to the door and looks out the peephole. The beautiful Lilo. 
Corbin panics, overcome with happiness. Shit! What is it? Corbin has two seconds to make something up to get rid of Monroe. It's my wife. I thought you were divorced. I mean, my future. My ex. My future ex. If she sees you here, I'm finished. She hates you guys. It's what killed us in the first place. Please. She puts them in the fridge, shoving the jellyfish cake in Iceborg's hands. Sorry, General, but I've got no choice. It'll only take a minute. Let me set up another meeting and I'll be back. Three of us will never fit in there. Corbin pushes him. Oh, yes, you will. Corbin slams the fridge door and the doorbell rings again. Coming! He whips through his place in ten seconds and gathers up things laying about. He shuts drawers, rolls up his laundry in the folding bed. He brushes his hair back and opens the door with a big smile, only to discover a gun stuck between his eyes, held by Cornelius. A pipulolai. I suppose that means hi? I'm sorry we have to resort to such methods, but we heard about your good luck on the radio. We need the tickets to Floston. Is that the usual way priests go on vacation? We're not going on vacation. We're on a mission. What kind of mission? To save the world. Good luck. Of course. Father, I was in the army for a while, and every time they told us we were on a mission to save the world, the only thing that changed was I lost a lot of friends. So thanks for the offer, but no thanks. Cornelius is disappointed. Lilo looks crestfallen. I'm sorry. A voice comes from the hall. This is a police control action. Everyone freezes as the whole building resounds with the electronic voice. A group of policemen burst into the hallway. One of the cops enters a code on the police wall box. A device descends from the ceiling, a flashing light siren. A voice fills the air. This is not an exercise. This is a police control. Cornelius starts to panic, and Corbin takes charge. Oh my god! Oh my god! Corbin pushes a button, sending the fridge to the next floor. A shower takes its place. Lilo, hide in here and don't move. Lilo hops in. Corbin tosses Cornelius on the bed. What are you doing? Trying to save your ass, so you can save the world. He hits a button on the wall, and the bed disappears into the wall. Corbin grabs his tickets and slides them into his belt. Meanwhile, the automatic police voice continues. Spread your legs and place your hands in the yellow circles, please. A cop slaps a viewer device on Corbin's door, which makes part of it transparent. Put your hands in the yellow circles, please. Corbin takes his time hiding his face. The cop looks at his sheet. He's looking for a Corbin Dallas. He has the picture, but it's Corbin with long hair and a beard. Sir, are you a human? No, I'm a meat popsicle. I found him! A close-up of Corbin's calling card is clumsily stuck to the door of a neighbor's apartment. Cop 3 slaps the viewer on the nasty neighbor's door. The neighbor is at his sink shaving instead of against the wall. Cop 1 arrives with Corbin's picture. Sir, this is a control. Please put your hands in the yellow circles. The neighbor steps right up to the viewer, shaving cream on his face. He could pass for Corbin. Fuck you! Corbin still has his hands to the wall. Wrong answer. An explosion and a scuffle. The riot police hustle down the hall, dragging the neighbor behind them in a canvas bag. A cop is on the wall phone. Okay, we got the guy under wraps. In Zorg's office, right arm is on the phone facing Zorg. It was not easy, but we bagged him. Thanks for the tip. Right arm, smiling. Glad to help. He hangs up. They just arrested the guy for uranium smuggling. Everything is going as planned. He shows him a plane ticket and a passport with his picture and Corbin's name. All I have to do now is go to the airport and take his place. I should be in Floston in less than four hours. 
Sorg sits there quietly for a moment. Don't come back without the stones. Corbin opens the shower door. Lilo is soaking wet, her teeth chattering from the cold. I'm really sorry, there wasn't time. His eyes fall on an old blanket. Here, let me wrap you up. Corbin wraps her in a blanket and vigorously rubs her back. Lilo warms gradually and snuggles closer to that warm, comfortable shoulder. Corbin's rubbing slows, looking more like a caress. It's funny, I've met you twice today, and you've ended up in my arms both times. Lilo suddenly realizes that maybe she has gone a bit too far. She recovers and looks embarrassed, too. Valo masa, chacha hamas. Ah, uh, you're welcome? The intimacy makes him nervous. He looks for a diversion. Coffee, that's what you need. A nice hot cup of coffee. He pushes a button on the coffee machine. With some honey. You'll see, honey is great. Corbin rummages through the drawer. Lilo, innocent, doesn't seem to quite understand everything that's going on. A hot cup of coffee with honey. He rummages through the cupboard. Exceedingly nervous. Lilo smiles and begins to look around. She opens a drawer and comes upon... Huh, I got this uh, great honey somewhere. You know honey? Used to be these little animals who made it with, uh, with antenna. Pictures of Major Corbin Dallas, the war hero. And these other animals who all ate it... One was bees and the others were bears. She looks back to the man fumbling for honey. I forget which ate and which made it, but... She smiles. Here it is. Corbin holds up the jar of honey. Taste this. Lilo innocently sticks his finger in the jar, then puts it in her mouth. It melts in your mouth, doesn't it? She savors the honey, slowly and sensually. Her lips shine. Her eyes narrow with pleasure. Corbin is hypnotized by her lips, like a moth attracted to a flame. He begins to lose control, which makes him nervous. An indistinct sound comes from the wall, but Corbin is so entranced with the sight of Lilo licking her fingers, he doesn't hear it until it becomes quite a racket. You hear that? Lilo licking. Cornelius. Oh, God! Corbin pushes the button on the wall. The bed pops out, fully made, with Cornelius tucked in, struggling to get out. I'm really sorry. Let me help you. Corbin begins to pull at the covers when... Achka, je lumetai de matala. Corbin turns. What? He turns to Lilo, struggling out of her clothes. His breath is taken away by the sight of her perfect body. Cornelius whacks him heavily on the head with a lamp. Corbin drops to the floor. Lilo is displeased. Vanoda, machpteba, su do makala chon hamas. No, I'm not proud of myself, but we don't have the luxury of choice. The police exit the elevator and head for the front door of Corbin's building. A cop suddenly takes a hit from a silencer, then a second. Others are bashed on the head by Mangalore warriors. One of them picks up the prisoner bag, takes it into a small shed. Aknot, Aknot, the Mangalore leader, is seriously wounded and can't talk. Corbin Dallas, we got him. Perfect. Take command, Aknot. Go to Floston and get the stones. If Zorg really wants them, he'll have to negotiate. Revenge is at hand. Corbin gets unsteadily to his feet. Blood drips down his face. He dabs at it. Jesus, some priest. The phone rings and he manages to answer. Yeah? Have you pulled yourself together? Not yet. He hangs up. Corbin opens the fridge door. The three soldiers are frozen solid. Corbin grabs some ice and presses it to his forehead. I'll take the mission. He closes the door. Cornelius and Lilo, still damp, arrive at the Manhattan Intergalactic Airport. A huge hall, three-quarter filled with trash, piled up to the ceiling. There are groups of extraterrestrials on a strike landing 
and trash holding pocket signs. A security guard picks up a phone off the wall. Illegal gathering in Zone 4. A hand taps Lilo from behind. She whips around, catching David in the face. Lilo, be careful. He turns to David, who's holding his bloody nose. Did you get them? David hands Cornelius two passports. Excellent. Lilo Dallas. He hands it to her. The name makes her smile. And Corbin David Dallas. She frowns. Atka didero en selidemectic. I can't pretend to be your husband, but David is in great shape. He looks at David holding his bloody nose. He'll protect you. Go on, see the diva, get the stones. We'll see you at the temple, and God be with you. Corbin comes rushing into the airport. Walking quickly, he scopes the hall looking for Lilo. A police patrol bearing down on the strikers jostle him. The cops open fire. The strikers dive into the garbage and disappear. David nervously puts the tickets and IDs on the check-in counter. Lilo tosses her suitcase on the conveyor belt. Congratulations on winning the contest. David gives her a bleak smile, and Lilo rolls her eyes. Back a ways, Corbin has spotted Lilo and David. He heads right for them. Lilo has seen him. She's both delighted and panicked. David sees nothing. Corbin presses one of his fingers like a gun to David's back. Hey, I really thought I was going to miss my flight. Hey, thanks, kid. You put the luggage on the conveyor belt? David, freaking. Uh, yeah? Great! Now beat it. Paralyzed, David leaves, and Corbin turns to the attendant. Excuse me, so afraid I'd miss the flight, I sent the kid here to pick up my boarding card. He looks at David's fake ID. My cousin, David. Lilo is unable to hold back a smile. The flight attendant looking at Lilo's ID. Your wife? Corbin grabs the ID and reads it. Uh, yeah, newlyweds. You know how it is, love at first sight. You meet, something goes tilt, you get married, you hardly know each other. Right, darling? Lilo rips her boarding card out of the attendant's hand. Tin wen chen ganda tat. Took the words right out of my mouth. Go on, I'll be right with you. It's our honeymoon. We're going to use the trip to get to know each other better. He winks at the stewardess. The neighbor and a tawdry young girl cross the airport. The couple almost knock over a police patrol holding a 500-pound pig on a stainless steel leash. The couple panics a moment. They realize the patrol isn't for them. The pig heads for the pile where the strikers disappeared. Come on, sniper. Go root. The pig piles into the garbage. The cop cuts it some slack. Cornelius sits at the bar. I feel so guilty sending her to do the dirty work. I know she was made to be strong, but she's also so fragile and so human. You know what I mean? The bartender, a robot, nods his head as he pours Cornelius a drink. The nasty neighbor and his wife hand their tickets to the check-in attendant. Dallas Corbin? In a different voice. Yeah, that's me. The check-in attendant triggers a transparent blue light that shines on their faces, revealing two other faces. Mangalores. Just a minute, please. She hits a silent alarm, but the Mangalores feel something is wrong. We will be right back. We're going to check out the duty-free. They spin around and hurry away. Cornelius at the bar, half in the bag. The same? Yeah. Make that two. Cornelius turns to David. Where's Lilo? On the plane with Mr. Dallas, the real one. It's all my fault. I'm the servant. It's my mission. Here. He hands David the temple key from around his neck. Here's the key to the temple. Prepare for our arrival. Cornelius tosses David's drink into his own, downs it all in one shot, and takes off, passing the Mangalore couple, headed for the exit. 
They are very nervous. A police patrol is coming. This time, it seems to be for them. Tell Agnot Plan A flopped. Tell him to go to Plan B. The tawdry girl nods and peels off. The neighbor takes out a gun and blasts away the cops. The cops fire back. A firefight rages in the hall. The tawdry girl dives into a pile of garbage and disappears. The cop into the walkie-talkie. Send in a backup unit! Zone 7! On the one side of the hall, a trap door opens. Three pigs come running out, grabbed by their police handler. Cornelius waits until everyone has left. He gets down on all fours and crawls through the trap door, reserved for the pigs. Lilo stands at the buffet in the first-class lounge, eating everything in sight. Corbin is led down the hall by a stewardess. You are so lucky. Loke Rod is the coolest DJ in the universe. Listen, I don't want to be interviewed. I'd prefer to remain anonymous. The stewardess stops. Forget anonymous. You'll be doing Loke Rod's show every day from 5 to 7. Corbin's expression changes. You gotta be kidding. The stewardess smiles and shakes her head. The door next to him suddenly swings open and smashes him in the face. In walks Loke Rod, amidst a tornado of music and security guards. He is a young, good-looking, eccentric, charming as an elf or sly as a fox, a bundle of energy. He's the 24th century's most popular DJ, speedy and in rhythm. Corbin Dallas, he is the most hated man in the universe, the one and only winner of the Gemini Croquette Contest. Ladies, start melting, because the boy is hot, hot, hot. The boy is perfect. He feels his muscles. The right size, the right build, the right hair. Right on. Say something to those 50 billion pairs of ears out there, D-man. An assistant hands a totally lost Corbin a mic. Hi. Does it get better or what? Loke Rod grabs Corbin's arm and leads him down the hallway as fast as his music. Quiver, ladies, he's going to set the world on fire right here from five to seven. You'll know everything there is to know about the D-man, his dreams, his desires. He is most intimate of intimates. From what I'm looking at, intimate is this stud muffin's middle name. So tell me, my main man, you nervous in the service? Uh, not really. Loke Rod lets go of Corbin's arm and grabs the stewardess. Freeze those knees, my chickadees, cause Corbin is on the case with a major face. Loke Rod rubs up against the stewardess. Start drooling, ladies. My man here is a sharp-tongued sire who's gonna stroke your every desire. They come to an intersection. The airline company has prepared drinks for them. Loke Rod pushes on, grabs a glass of champagne, and scribbles his autograph. Yesterday's unknown will be tomorrow's Prince of Floston Paradise, the hotel of a thousand and one follies, home of luxury and beauty, a magic fountain flowing with non-stop wine, women, and boochie coochie coo. He tosses away his champagne glass. Beware out there, my puppy dogs. This man is on the prowl. Ow! Howling, Loke Rod grabs another stewardess by the arm. And start licking your stamps, little girls. This guy's gonna have you writing home to your mama. Tomorrow from five to seven, I'll be your voice, your tongue. I'll be hot on the tail of the sexiest man of the year. D-man, your man, my man. The stewardess shivers. A beep is heard. End of transmission. The music suddenly stops. Several assistants come and compliment Loke, who sighs, lights up a cigarette, and drops his pretense. Corbin, sweetheart, do me a favor. I know this is probably the biggest thing that's ever happened to you in your inconsequential life, but I've got a show to do here, and it's gotta pop. So tomorrow, when you're on air, give me a hand. Try to make believe you have more than a one-word vocabulary, okay, pal? That does it. Corbin grabs him by the collar and drags him into a corner. Loke Rod's feet don't touch the ground. Corbin is pissed. I didn't come here to play Dumbo on the radio, so tomorrow between 5 and 7, give yourself a hand. Is that clear, pal? Loke Rod, petrified. Crystal! 
The check-in attendant has two more tickets in her hand. Alters a moment, reading, Mr. Dallas? Corbin Dallas? Zorg's right arm gives her a big smile. That's right. The attendant scans the ID with a yellow beam. It checks out, and the blue light reveals no other face but his. The problem is, I only have one Corbin Dallas on my list, and he's already checked in. Right arm's smile shatters. That's impossible. He's in... I mean, there must be some mistake. I have my ticket. I'm the real Corbin Dallas. A shrill bell rings out. She smiles. I'm sorry, sir. Boarding is finished. The attendant hits a button, and a thick window slowly slides up between them. Right arm totally loses it. I want to see your boss. Get rid of this fucking window. Somebody made a mistake, goddammit. He pounds on the counter with both fists. A steel curtain comes down. Red sighting beams target spots on his body. Ten gun barrels protrude from the wall, all aimed at him. This is not an exercise. This is a police control. Put your hands in the nearest yellow circles. Right arm slows down. Sorry, my fault. Just a little overexcited, that's all. I'm calm now. Corbin makes his way in the plane, looking for his seat. No more seats in modern planes, just individual travel boxes lined like microwaves. He passes a steward with a bloodied nose. He has found what he's looking for. He enters to Lilo, quietly stretched out in front of a computer screen. Corbin slips in beside her. She's concentrated on the words that scroll rapidly past her on the screen. He doesn't understand what she's doing. A people I. Not hard to find you. Just follow the chaos. Lilo smiles as if complimented. Lilo, listen to me. These tickets, they're not mine. I mean, they are, but not for vacation like everyone thinks. I'm on an operation, and if I didn't come get you, you'd be in a shitload of trouble. I'd love to be on vacation with you. But now, now I've got to work. And Lilo, I would love to work in peace. Lilo types in love on the keyboard. Love. Yes, but love isn't the operative word here. Peace is. Lilo types in this new word. She's rather pleased. Peace and love. She brings up a picture of 60s style hippie flashing a peace sign. Corbin sighs and switches off the screen. Sometimes you can't learn everything from a screen. Sometimes it's better to ask someone who has experience. Lilo, happy. What is make love? Corbin just stares at her for a few minutes. Know what? On that subject, maybe you'd be better off asking the screen. She turns the computer back on. A stewardess walks up the aisle of the shuttle, pushing the red buttons on top of each individual box. To make your flight as short and agreeable as possible, our flight attendants are switching on the timing sleeper, which will regulate your sleep during the trip. Lilo switching off the screen. Okay, finished. Finished what? Learning language. Which one? All 900. Corbin doesn't know if he should laugh or not. You learned 900 languages in five minutes? Yes, now it's your turn. I learned your language, you have to learn mine. I know how to say hello. Teach me how to say goodbye, and that's all I need. A pipusan. A pupusan? Good. Do you know how we say make love? Corbin fumbles. Hippy hoppa. Corbin literally melts to himself. Help? Luckily, a stewardess smiles at him through a box window. Sweet dreams, Mr. Dallas. The stewardess sets the timing sleeper. Corbin and Lilo immediately fall asleep. A stewardess at the other end of the shuttle has a problem. Mr. Lokrod, you have to assume your individual position. He hugs her. I don't want an individual position. I want all the positions. Stewardess 2 resisting. We're going to take off soon, Mr. Rod. 
three crew members prepare for liftoff. The co-pilot. Molecular Axis Authorization. Vector 130. Destination, Floston. Stewardess 1 enters the cockpit. Zone 1, 217 locked. The sleep regulator is okay. The pilot checks her out. Thanks, miss. The stewardess leaves with a smile. A red light flashes on the vast control panel. Tell the ground crew we've got parasites in the landing gear. A ground crew member goes over to the truck parked under one of the plane's wings and bangs on the side of it with a shout. Disinfecting! Two disinfectors in hermetically sealed suits exit the truck. They go over to the front landing gear and send up a whooshing beam. The flame burns everything it touches. A pack of repugnant creatures fall squealing from the landing gear. A small trap door is opened under the shuttle, and a huge, slightly phosphorescent tube falls out. Zorg's right arm is in a phone booth in the middle of the hall. Yeah, it's me. Put Zorg on. He's already sweating. Zorg coldly. I'm listening. The real Corbin Dallas is on the plane. He took my place. This is a joke, right? Loke Rod is wrapped around a stewardess like a snake. No, I swear to God, I've never been this sincere with a human before. Two ground crew members stick an enormous, highly phosphorescent tube into the opening. You're fueled and ready to go. Have a nice flight the pilot to the co-pilot. Is everything ready for liftoff? The stewardess weakly. No, I'm not ready. I'd like to talk first. Zorg. I cannot hear you. We have a bad connection here. What's your number? The right arm reads off the phone number. 278-500-645-321. I'll call you back. The runway is now empty. A man slips out of the shadows. It's Cornelius. He scurries over to the front landing gear. He pauses for an instant, then climbs up the wheel well and disappears inside the shuttle. The pilots are going through the pre-flight checklist. Anti-static pressure. Primed. The mechanic presses a series of buttons. Loke Rod undoes a series of buttons on the stewardess's blouse behind a curtain. He whispers a poem. Impossible to resist him. Outside the curtain, the stewardess's leg rises slowly. On the ground, protective fire curtains rise slowly to contain the engine's exhaust on liftoff. A keyboard slowly appears in front of Zorg. 278-500 In a series of quick cuts, the pilot gradually turns the engines up. Ten seconds. Power increase. The stewardess undergoes a power surge from Loke Rod that's about to lift her off. Zorg finishes gleefully typing in the number. Three, two, one. The engine goes at full blast. The stewardess is close to screaming. Lift off! The co-pilot pushes a button, and so does Zorg. The engine releases its full power. The stewardess screams in ecstasy. In the right hall, right arm literally explodes along with the phone and everything else within 60 feet. The stewardess's leg slowly descends and disappears behind the curtain. In the cockpit, the atmosphere loosens up. The co-pilot relaxes. Landing gear secure. Let's light one up. Corbin and Lilo sleep soundly in their box. Lilo has a smile on her face, and her hand is in Corbin's. The spaceship rockets past us through space, then suddenly vanishes with amazing speed. Everything is empty and calm. Billions of stars glow in perfect silence. The nefarious planet is still there, immobile, even larger now and writhing like a serpent. Then, for no apparent reason, all activity stops and it becomes gray and cold. In the Admiral's starship, scientists watch the measuring device. 
one of the devices suddenly starts working. All right, we're finally getting something. The head scientist stands facing the president, who is looking more tired than ever. The thing is sending out radio wavelengths. What the hell does it want with radio waves? Probably wants to make a call. The president and his generals look at him in astonishment. Picasso purrs contentedly on Zorg's lap. The phone rings. Mr. Shadow on the line? Zorg shoots to his feet. Picasso tumbles to the floor. Zorg picks up the phone, both excited and uneasy. He stands there, almost coming to attention. Yes, Zorg here. The voice is feeble. It comes from the far reaches of time, from the bowels of the universe. Am I disturbing you? No, not at all. Where are you? The shadow's breathing is awesome. Not far now. Really? Maybe I can get you on my screen and see you at last. Zorg brings up a huge screen and pushes a few buttons. In the middle of an electronic snowstorm, a blackish, vaguely human, quivering form appears. Two eyes like lava give an idea where the head is. Zorg feels sick. Do you have a picture now, Mr. Zorg? Got it. How's our deal coming along? Zorg, ill at ease. Fine, just fine. I'll have the four pieces you asked for any time now. But it wasn't easy. My costs have tripled. Shadow pauses an instant. A black, slimy liquid starts to ooze from the top of the screen. Zorg is feeling worse all the time. Money is of no importance. I want the stones. The black liquid oozes all over the screen, which starts to melt. Zorg sweats profusely. His legs tremble. The stones will be here. I'll see to it personally. I can't wait to be among you. Zorg sighs and sits down, totally freaked. The space shuttle fills the screen. It banks left and begins its descent toward Floston, the turquoise planet. Crystal blue water, perfect white sand beaches, a true paradise. A stewardess picks up a microphone to make an announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, we have begun our descent toward Floston Paradise. Stewardesses walk down the aisles, waking the passengers one by one. They press a button on the door of each box. In the corner, Loke Rod and the stewardess awake with a start and straighten their clothes quickly. The stewardess is embarrassed. I wanted to tell you that... Loke Rod puts on his sunglasses and presses a finger to her lips. He disappears behind the curtain, leaving the sighing stewardess on her own. The spaceship descends through some clouds and glides over a vast turquoise sea. Floston Paradise looms into view. An enormous ocean liner, floating a dozen yards above the water. On closer inspection, it is more modern than a traditional ocean liner. The shuttle draws near, looking ridiculously small next to this monster like a sardine next to a whale. A blinking light in the cockpit goes on. Shit. Parasites in Zone 1. Take a look. The first mate heads off. A stewardess opens Corbin's box door. He is still heavy with sleep. He looks over at Lilo, but she is not there. The tiny space shuttle clings to the huge ocean liner. The pilot maneuvers the ship into its docking area. Docking activated. You can let the passengers out. The first mate pries open the door to an overhead panel. Cornelius falls out, hanging in a jumble of wires. The enormous door opens and the passengers exit. Lilo is among them. She appears quite impressed by the beauty and luxury of the 19th century decoration. Corbin attempts to make his way up the shuttle's aisle. He's jostling everybody. Pardon me, excuse me, I'm trying to find my wife, sorry. A dozen policemen wait patiently at the end of the hall. Lilo stops and presses against the wall. She spots Corbin leaving the shuttle. A gorgeous hostess comes up to him. 
drapes a lei around his neck, and plants a kiss on his lips in welcome. Welcome to paradise. Corbin's face is covered in lipstick. Lilo sees he did nothing to stop the girl, and she doesn't like it. A hefty man wearing a sarong drapes some flowers around her neck. Then, obviously relishing it, he leans down to kiss her. Lilo bashes him on the forehead. The hefty man straightens up. He's still smiling, but his nose is bleeding. He falls slowly to the floor. Corbin pushes forward, trying to spot Lilo. He also tries to wipe the lipstick off. Lilo tries to escape through a door marked Personnel Only, but it's locked. A host looks at her with a grin. If you don't have the code, you can't open it. Lilo smiles and punches in an old code and twists the doorknob. The door opens with the sound of a breaking lock. Lilo smiles sweetly and enters as if nothing were amiss. A shriek of joy fills the room and Corbin turns around. The hostesses cluster around Loke Rod as he comes out of the plane. Loke Rod spots Corbin and latches onto his arm. It's not going to be easy to remain discreet. He's relieved. My main man, please don't leave me alone. My head is killing me. My adoring fans are going to tear me apart. Get me out of here. I'll take you to the bar. After that, you're on your own. Hanging on to Corbin. Oh yes, do that. You treat me right. Tell me about yourself, your roots, your personal life, your childhood dreams. I don't think this is a good time. You got brothers and sisters? What about your dad? Tell me about your dad. What was he like, physically? Big, I suppose? Corbin, evasive. Yeah, very big. A giant. I didn't have a dad. Never saw him. Never even heard him. Fifty billion people listen to me every day and he doesn't hear me. Lilo is in a small room, ear at the door, listening. Everything seems normal. She turns and discovers the room for what it is. A restroom for three cops, who look up from their books and stare blankly at her. Lilo doesn't know what to do, so she smiles. The door opens to Corbin's stateroom. The hostess turns on the light and enters. Corbin follows her, gaping at the luxury. The baggage boy enters, bringing Lilo's two suitcases. Corbin grabs the notice announcing Diva Plava Laguna's concert at 5.30 in the evening. Formal attire. For the concert, it says formal attire, but I didn't bring any. The hostess pulls back the closet door. Twenty tuxedos in a row. She looks him over. Here's some champagne. I'll drop by after the concert to open it. She gives him a blinding smile and closes the door. Corbin pushes a button. The curtains open to reveal a most spectacular view of the turquoise planet. Stars shoot out into infinity. It's breathtaking. Corbin stands, gaping. The phone rings, snapping him out of his reverie. Hello? You little sleazebag! Ma? Don't you ever ask me for another thing in my life again! You've killed your poor mother with your own hands! Corbin drops into an armchair and sighs. His eyes go to the ceiling. Ma! The chief of police has Cornelius in front of him, handcuffed. The diva's ship is coming in. I want maximum security. Yes, sir. The chief of police turns to Cornelius. So, let's hear it. Where was I? He's bored already. You open the door, there's a cabbie with a girl in his arms. Fog opens the door. Two cops come hobbling in, all bloody and bandaged. They hold up a third cop. What happened? A bomb go off in your face? Yeah, a five foot seven inch bomb with green eyes. Cornelius perks up. And the smile of an angel? They all turn to look at him. May I speak to you alone, Chief? Lilo watches the diva's arrival. A door opens, and two policemen clear the way for Diva Plava Laguna, her manager, her bodyguards, and a gaggle of porters carrying trunks. Not wanting to draw attention to herself, Lilo feigns interest in a painting that is obviously upside down. 
a white chiffon veil, covers the face of the diva. She stops in front of Lilo. The diva reaches out, stroking Lilo's face without touching her. The diva removes her hand, making a sound of crackling electricity, then passes on. Lilo is groggy. The diva's assistant comes up to her. Please forgive this little incident. She wants you to know that she senses great power in you, in the service of a noble cause. She will give you what you have come to get, but she wants to sing first, one last time. The diva's assistant turns the painting right side up. Miss? Lilo looks at the painting and seems to understand it better. Policemen stand at attention in front of the diva's suite. Hello, I'm head of security. Everything is in order. You can... The diva enters her suite without letting him finish. Make yourself at home safely. If you need anything, give it a knock. A door opens near the police officer's main entrance. Cornelius looks both ways, then crosses the hall, dragging the chief of police by the feet. Corbin finishes putting on his tux, still on the phone. Listen, Ma, I've only got a few days vacation and I'll be damned if I'm going to spend them on the phone. The door rings. Hold on, it's the door. No, I told you I didn't bring anybody. I'm all alone. As usual. Corbin opens the door. It's not the champagne, but even better, it's Lilo. To his mother, I'll call you back. Lilo heads right for her suitcase and starts to undress. Corbin has to turn away once more. Here we go again. You know women normally change five times more than men? You get that off your screen? Yes. You know, there's a lot of differences between men and women. You noticed. Okay, you can turn around. Corbin turns around. Lilo has put on a very simple dress, which is sexy to the max. He is smitten, so much that Lilo wonders if something isn't quite right. Where are you going? I'm going to see the diva sing. What's the matter? Do I look bad? No, no, not at all. I mean, just the opposite. You're beautiful. Lilo smiles at him. His compliment pleases her. She turns, revealing her unzippered back. Corbin cannot help but stare at the bare flesh, her perfect bottom. Do you know how this works? Corbin's blood boils. She wriggles, pressing her hands together closer to the zipper. I have an idea. But instead of pulling on the zipper, he slips a bracelet on her wrist. A fluorescent beam bursts out of the bracelet and forms a vertical bar going from the floor to the ceiling. Stunned, Lilo is held captive. I told you I need to work in peace. I need to concentrate, remember? And you can't concentrate with me around? It's difficult. She tries to break out. Army issue, I'm sorry. Lilo tries desperately to get out of the handcuffs, but it's impossible. Corbin sets the radio down in front of her and turns it on. Lilo looks like she would like to break his head. You're nothing but a... The words you're looking for weren't in the dictionary you studied. I won't be long. The door flies open, and Loke Rod barges in. Hey, stud, we gotta... Then he sees the scene with Lilo cuffed in a low-cut dress. His mind goes to the obvious. Corbin, my man, what's going on here? Who's the chick? What's the gig? We freeform in here? Getting funky with the monkey? Can I get in on this? Corbin grabs him by the collar. No, to all of the above, and yanks Lokrod out of the room, leaving Lilo looking extremely unhappy. Lokrod and Corbin enter what looks to be a replica of the Garnier Opera in Paris. A hostess escorts them to their seats. Lokrod is broadcasting. We have just walked in to what is probably the most beautiful concert hall in the universe. Totally awesome. Magnificent paintings on the ceiling. I don't know who painted them, but he must have busted his balls. I see a row of former ministers, more sinister than minister. A few generals practicing how to sleep, and there's Baby Ray, star of the stage and screen, drowning in a sea of nymphets. 
He's not going to get much out of this concert. He's stone death. Baby Ray bending his ear to a girl asking for an autograph. To who? Loke Rod moving down the aisle. And over there is Roy Von Bacon. The king of laser ball and the best paid player in the league. He shakes his hand. And over there is Emperor Kodar Javit, whose daughter Achen is still at the bar. I love to sing too, but in the shower. She recently confessed to me. She will no doubt prove to be as generous tonight as she always is. A waiter giving them two glasses of champagne. Track with the waiter as he leaves the hall with his empty tray. He enters a small room reserved for staff. The waiter joins with some others. They are well armed. He opens a cupboard and pulls out a humongous weapon. Suddenly their faces burn off, revealing Akanit, the young leader of the Mangalores and his troops. It's showtime! The lights dim slowly in the concert hall. President Lindbergh and his staff, including Monroe, sit at their desk. Speakers appear. Lilo, still a prisoner, listens to the concert. Corbin is tense. The curtains rise. The diva, in a stunning gown, stands in the center of the stage, head bowed. Behind her, a star-filled window. The music begins. The diva looks up. A true rare beauty, but an alien. She begins to sing. Her voice is divine, unmatched. Corbin is swept up in the tears. Lilo has tears in her eyes. The manager, in the diva suite, couldn't care less about the concert. His main problem is the bottle of scotch he can't seem to open. The doorbell rings. Yeah? Flowers for the diva? She's allergic to flowers. There's champagne as well. The manager takes one look at the stubborn bottle and opens the door. He finds himself staring down the barrel of a gun and a dozen Mangalores rush in. One of them, with a human face, closes the door and waits out in the hall. Cornelius watching from around the corner. My God! In the Floston Paradise control room. Commander, I have a ship with a main malfunction. He requests permission to dock for repairs. Did you check his registration number? Everything is in order. Put him in the docking garage and inform the police. Permission granted, Doc 575. You will have an hour. Will that be enough? Zorg sits at the controls. More than enough. The ZFX approaches Floston. The ship comes close enough for Lilo to see it out the window. It is the same ship with Mangalores at the controls that attacked the Mondashawans at the beginning of our story. Lilo is alarmed. She has to act. She seizes the fluorescent bar beam with great effort and rams it into the ceiling, making a hole large enough for her to escape. Cornelius bursts into the closet. He leaves the chief of police tied and gagged in there. He quickly unties him. Mangalores! The diva sweet! They must want the sacred stones! They must be stopped! We must stop them! I'm going to free you, but you must promise to help me! The chief of police nods his agreement. In the diva's suite, the Mangalores have trashed it. One of the Mangalores finally finds a case engraved with the four elements. I have it. The Mangalore is about to open the case when Lilo descends quietly and gracefully from the ceiling. Time stands still. A pipulai, she smiles. The diva switches from classical music to funk, picking up the tempo. A warrior whips out the biggest knife ever made and rushes Lilo. She disarms him gracefully. A violent fight breaks out. The diva sings and Lilo dances. The Mangalores pay a heavy price for the show. We hear noise from inside the suite in the corridor. The Mangalore by the door gets nervous and runs for reinforcements. Cornelius enters the police station wearing handcuffs. The chief of police is behind him holding a gun. Lilo knocks out the last Mangalore just as the diva finishes her song to a burst of applause. The diva takes a bow, and so does Lilo. Akanit and his men listen to the concert. The Mangalore guard rushes in. They were waiting for us. 
It was an ambush. If it's war they want, it's war they'll get. Enact the final plan. All the Mangalores cock their weapons. Lilo is about to open the case, and the door explodes. Zorg is there, holding a ZF-1. My compliments, little lady, and thanks for doing all the dirty work. I couldn't have done it any better myself. Now hand over the stones. Lilo smiles and hands him the case. Zorg arms the ZF-1 and gets ready to kill her. Nice knowing you. Lilo catches on quickly. She kicks the scotch bottle on the floor, which throws Zorg's shot off. She jumps to the ceiling and disappears in an air vent. Furious, Zorg fires at the ceiling. Lilo dodges the bullets as best she can from inside an air shaft. Zorg fires his 3,000 rounds. The ceiling looks like a piece of Swiss cheese. Zorg sticks a small cylinder in the wall and flicks it on. The numbers flashing tell us it's a bomb. The timer reads 19 minutes 59 seconds. With a crafty smile. You can run, but you can't hide. Cornelius is seated opposite the chief of police. A medic is bandaging the chief's head. The door explodes. The cop outside is riddled with bullets. A dozen Mangalores attack the police officer. A conant is at their head. The policemen are caught unaware. Nobody move. We are taking over this ship. The chief of police is goggle-eyed. Cornelius leans toward him, pleased with himself. I told you. Zorg now has the case and exits the suite just as the general alarm goes off. He sighs in exasperation. Three Mangalores suddenly rush into the opera hall shouting, Everyone down! There's panic everywhere. Lokrod, still broadcasting, panic-stricken. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're being attacked. The place is crawling with warriors. President Lindbergh and his generals in their office look very worried. Some security guards open fire and one of the Mangalores is hit. The others turn their guns on the cops. People scream, diving for cover. Corbin bides his time. More Mangalores rush in from all around, shooting. Two cops are killed. The diva takes a bullet. She falls from the stage and into Corbin's arms. He lowers her to the floor. Corbin ignores the panic all around and wraps her in his dinner jacket, trying to stop the blue blood from spurting from her wounds. Zorg's ZFX-200 speeds away from the boat. Zorg is at the controls, a devilish smile on his lips. You want something done? Do it yourself. Fighting rages all around in the concert hall, but Corbin is oblivious to it. He sets the diva's head delicately on the floor. Loke Rod is hidden nearby, still on air. His voice is low and panicked. They're hideous. They've got a crest on the head, the eyes of a toad, and fingers all over their hands. Totally hideous. The president's office. Monroe is worried. Mangalores. Send a battalion out immediately. Corbin to the diva. I was sent by the government to help you. Don't worry. This is my fate. How was the concert? Corbin is a little surprised, but the diva is an artist. I've never heard anything so beautiful in my entire life. A Mangalore jumps on them from the stage. Corbin makes short work of him and grabs his gun. You're a good man. She was right to have chosen you. Who? The fifth element. The supreme being. Your wife. Corbin is floored. Lilo? Is... She's... Yes, and more than that. You must give her the stones. She's the only one who knows how to use them. Corbin to himself, suddenly realizing. So Cornelius was telling the truth? The Mangalores tie up Cornelius and the chief of police together. Cornelius to the chief of police. Of course I was telling you the truth. If you had listened to me in the first place, we wouldn't be in this predicament now. Corbin wastes two more Mangalores. She needs you. 
She needs your help and your love. She's more fragile than she seems. Corbin looks around, ready for another attack. Yeah, so am I. The diva takes his hand. She was taught to love the life of others, but not her own. You have to teach her to love, if you want her to truly live. Corbin uncomfortable. I'll help her, I promise, but I think you should tell me where the stones are. Do you love her? Uh, I don't know. We hardly know each other. It takes time. I don't have time. I need to know. Listen, the last time I admitted to a woman that I loved her, I never saw her again. I would like to have died in peace. The diva's eyes close. The timer on Zorg's bomb clicks over to 15 minutes. You tell me to save the world? Then you go off and leave me in the shit? He shakes her, gently slapping her cheeks. Come on, you're not going to die in peace. You're not going to die at all, you hear me? Where are the stones? Zorg sets the sacred case on a table in the cockpit. He opens it with a complacent smile. But it's empty. He cannot believe his eyes. He goes berserk, destroying everything in sight. Corbin slaps the diva soundly. She comes around somewhat. I'm sorry, but, but the stones... Very weak. They are with me. The diva dies, and blue blood streams from her mouth. Corbin frisks the diva, but doesn't find anything. The shooting slowly stops in the theater. The Mangalores are now in total control. Stay calm, and no one will get hurt. Hands on your head, and into the hall. The guests all comply. The stones are with me? And then it occurs to Corbin. In me? He touches the diva's stomach and senses something hard. Girding himself, he sticks his hand in the wound and pulls out a sacred stone. Then another and another. He pulls out all four stones, which are covered in blue blood. Everyone has left the theater. The Mangalores check the aisle one by one. Loke Rod peeks out from under a seat. Don't you think we better be going? A Mangalore spots Corbin kneeling alongside the diva. He grabs him by the shoulder and pokes him with his gun. Hey, you! With the others! Corbin spins and in one swift motion breaks his arm, for starters. Another warrior rushes over. Corbin punches him into oblivion and snatches the gun. That's it. All day people have been sticking guns in my face. Corbin wraps up the four stones in his shirt. Corbin, man, these dudes are going to waste us if we don't do what they say. Corbin gives him the package and grabs his mic. If you don't do what I say, I'll waste you myself. Got it? Uh, got it. In the president's office, the president dabs his sweaty face with a towel. Akinit is still in the police station facing the control screens. He barks into a walkie-talkie. What's the situation in the hall? Hostages are being gathered in the middle of the hall. They are surrounded by Mangalores who guard them. Into the walkie-talkie. There's no more resistance. Everything is under control. Three Mangalores are suddenly blasted through the glass door leading to the theater. Corbin bursts into the hall. Two huge guns in his hands. Everybody down! Corbin takes out two more warriors coming towards him, rolls behind a column. Laser bullets stinging all around his head. This is amazing! Corbin, Corbin Dallas, the winner of the Gemini Croquettes contest, he just killed three warriors like he was swatting flies. There's panic everywhere, heavy firing fills the hall. Roy Von Bacon, the laser ball player, rises from the floor behind a Mangalore, grabs him and smashes his head into a column seizing his gun. Two Mangalores fire a huge machine gun at the column that Corbin is using for cover. He dives behind the bar. Two Mangalores watch awestruck. Roy whistles behind them. The two Mangalores turn around, and Roy bonks their heads together. It's Roy Von Bacon, the lion's center forward. He's joining the battle. 
Someone taps Loke Rod on the shoulder. He jumps with fright. Princess Achen. All this is terribly exciting, hmm? Loke Rod covers his mic. Get off my back! A Mangalore shoots in their direction. Loke Rod flattens himself on the floor. A vase falls on the princess, knocking her out. A Mangalore loads some missiles in his gun and destroys the bar piece by piece, forcing Corbin to move forward. Corbin motions to Baby Ray, hiding under the pool table. Toss me the balls! Baby Ray is terrified, and he's obviously still deaf. What? Another piece of the bar explodes. The balls, for Christ's sake! Corbin apes playing pool, but Baby Ray really is stone deaf. He wants the balls! Are you deaf or something? The Emperor rolls the balls to Corbin. The Mangalore loads more missiles and shatters another part of the bar. Corbin hides behind the last bit that's left. How far is he from here? The Emperor glances at the Mangalore, who is reloading. I'd say about 30 yards to the left. Corbin hefts the ball, jumps up, and hurls it with blinding speed. The Mangalore catches it right in the head. He drops, firing in the air. The missile crashes into the ceiling, which collapses on him. The Emperor gives Corbin a thumbs up. And our man Corbin has literally knocked out the opposition with an amazing 90-foot pitch! The cops on the floor rise, scoop up weapons from dead Mangalores, and lay down a line of fire in the last of the fleeing rebels. Roy whirls his arms in victory. Thanks for your help. Forget it. Corbin grabs Loke Rod and takes him with him. Corbin bursts into his suite. He stares at the luminous bar, still stuck to the ground, and sees the hole Lilo escaped through. Lilo? Lilo in the diva suite is bleeding all over. She can barely move. Corbin. The ZFX 200 speeds back toward Floston Paradise. The bomb timer now reads 10 minutes. The last of the Mangalores have barricaded themselves in the back of the station and shoot at anything that tries to enter. Corbin joins the policeman already there. Hey, who are you? The winner of the Gemini Croquette Contest? Corbin goes to the door and peeks around the corner. Loke Rod arrives. Seven to the left, five to the right. What is he doing? Corbin leans around the corner and fires rapidly. Six to the left, one to the right. He's on vacation. Corbin reloads. We gotta find the leader. Mangalores don't fight without a leader. Akonit gets up, grabs Cornelius by the throat, and puts a gun to his head. One more shot, and we start killing hostages. Got that? Corbin. I found him. Akonit tense. Send someone to negotiate. You mind if I go? I'm an excellent negotiator. Uh, sure, go ahead. Corbin gets ready. We're sending someone in who's authorized to negotiate. Corbin walks quickly into the room, heads straight for Akonit, raises his gun, and puts a bullet through his head. Anyone else want to negotiate? To another cop. Where'd he learn to negotiate like that? In the president's office. From us! The president gives Monroe a hard look. The police round up the remaining Mangalores. Corbin is at the control center screen, trying to find Lilo. Cornelius comes over to him, embarrassed. You're probably very angry with me, and I understand. But I want you to know that I'm fighting for a noble cause. Yeah, I know. Trying to save the world. But right now, all I want to do is save Lilo. Lilo is in trouble? When is she not in trouble? Uh, have you tried the diva suite? Corbin realizes that Cornelius is probably right. The ZFX-200 settles in the landing dock garage. Security police approach the ship just as Zorg is getting out, holding the ZF-1. More trouble? Nothing I can't fix myself. He brings up the ZF-1 and wipes out the garage. Corbin enters the diva's suite, which is in shambles. He looks everywhere, 
but finds nothing. Lilo lies in a pool of blood. She hears something below her. Exhausted, Loke Rod wipes his forehead and finds himself face to face with the bomb stuck on the wall. Corbin is busy looking for Lilo. Lilo? Up in the air shaft, Lilo has heard him. Corbin. Her voice is too weak, Corbin can't hear. Corbin, man, what the hell is all this? Corbin gives the bomb a perfunctory glance. A molecular bomb, three minutes left on the timer. Loke Rod, worried. And, uh, what are these numbers clicking by? Probably the time remaining before it explodes. Cornelius smiles and continues his search. Loke Rod, weak smile. You're just saying that to scare me, right? Because if it were a bomb, the alarm would have gone off. There's bomb detectors in all these hotels. A general alarm goes off. Loke Rod is crushed. The lights flicker in the hall. This is a Type A alert. For security reasons, the hotel must be evacuated. Please proceed calmly to the lifeboats located in the main hallways. A wave of panic engulfs the hall. The cops are unable to hold back the crowd as it stampedes to the exit. Zorg marches down the corridor, shooting everyone in his path. Loke Rod stands paralyzed in front of the flashing timer. Less than two minutes left. Maybe we ought to get going. What do you think? Not without Lilo. Loke Rod cannot take his eyes off the bomb. Like, D-Man, I hate to bother you, but uh, we're down to two minutes here. Corbin breathes out, bothered. He turns his attention to the bomb. It's the latest model. I've never seen one before. It works off a magnetic coated card. Let's see if I can rig it up. Lilo sticks her fingers out of one of the bullet holes and lets some of her blood drip down. The blood splats on Corbin's hand. He snaps his head up and knows immediately who is up there. He forgets about the bomb. Hey, what are you doing? The bomb! Corbin drags the desk over, jumps on it, and pokes his head in the torn up air shaft. He spots Lilo, who gives him a weak smile. Don't worry, I'm here now. He pulls her toward him, helps her out of the shaft, and stretches her out on the desk. Just relax, I've got the stones. Everything's going to be fine. 30 seconds left on the timer. Falling to pieces. Like Corbin, can I have 30 seconds of your time here? Corbin to Lilo. I'll be right back. Corbin dashes over to the bomb. He's stopped by the barrel of the ZF-1. Zorg, in person, holding a magnetic card. Allow me. Zorg slips a small magnetic card in the bomb. It starts to count down from five minutes. Just more for the fun of it. Lokrod faints. Well, what do we have here? Is this Corbin Dallas, the famous winner of the Gemini Croquette Contest? Or is this Corbin Dallas from Special Section, sent by old Limburg himself? Corbin doesn't reply. In any event, whoever you are, I was glad to meet you. Zorg fires at Corbin, who figures he is dead. But nothing. He tries again. Nothing. The clip is empty. Zorg starts to panic. A 3,000 round clip? I didn't fire off 3,000 rounds, did I? Don't you know how to count? It's not all that hard, watch. Corbin punches him square in the face and shows him his index. One, that's for trying to kill me. Second punch. Two, that's for firing me. Three, that's for pushing around a priest. And the rest is for what you did to my wife. Corbin pummels him mercilessly. President Limburg prefers closing his eyes. Monroe's shoulders move as if they were beating on Zorg. Zorg falls to the floor, beaten to a pulp. The timer clicks over three minutes. We're out of here. He picks Lilo up in his arms. Cornelius grabs Lokrod and gives him a resounding slap. Are you nuts, father? That hurts. I can't feel my teeth. Doesn't matter. All you need are your legs. The lifeboats launch from the hotel and fly out into space. Corbin, carrying Lilo, Cornelius, and Lokrod, 
are in the garage. Two minutes to complete evacuation. Corbin bursts the lock on the first ship he finds and enters, followed by Cornelius and Loke Rod. The ZFX 200. Zorg starts to come around. Corbin sets Lilo down. Zorg picks up his ZF-1, unaware of the bomb and the countdown. I didn't fire 3,000 rounds. One minute to total evacuation. Corbin, you know how to fly this thing? Concentrating. It's like a cab, isn't it? 30 seconds. Anyone know how to release the lines on this crate? Zorg is busy with the ZF-1, and the bomb starts to beep, signaling the last 10 seconds. He's terror-stricken. He pushes a button and holds the ZF-1 over his head. Maximum protection! A mauve-colored magnetic shield closes around Zorg like an indestructible sarcophagus. Cornelius and Loke Rod are bent over the buttons, looking for a way to release the lines. Six, five... Found it? Loke Rod searches frantically. I don't even know what I'm looking for! Fuck it! Hold tight! Corbin slams the throttle into full forward. The ship roars away, ripping the lines to shreds. Loke Rod is thrown to the rear of the ship. The counter goes one, then zero. The suite disintegrates, and the corridor is consumed. The main hall is no more. The ZFX-200 jets away as the enormous ocean liner explodes behind it. The ship stops shaking. That was a close one. Everyone is relieved. Solid little jobs, aren't they? Loke Rod broadcasting, exhausted. Dear listeners, your favorite DJ is alive and kicking. It's seven o'clock and time for the news. Tune in tomorrow for another adventure. Beep. End of transmission. Loke Rod lets out a huge sigh. The best show I ever did. The magnetic sarcophagus crosses the Floston sky and crashes into a glacier. Zorg appears in the middle of the ice. He takes a portable phone out of the ZF-1. How's that? Can you hear me better now? Yes, Mr. Zorg, I hear you perfectly. So, how was the concert? Who gives a shit? I didn't come here to listen to music. Listen up, instead of running off at the mouth, the batteries on my phone are almost gone. Yes, sir. Dispatch me another ZFX 200 immediately. Someone stole mine. Right away, sir. I'll send you a new one to the hotel. I'm not at the hotel. Hello? Battery dead. Zorg is all alone, lost in the middle of a glacier. To himself, Stay calm, stay calm. General Monroe enters the office of the president with a smile. Major Dallas has the five elements on board. The priest is guiding them directly to the temple. President Limburg closes his eyes in relief. Thank God we've been saved. A scientist rushes in. Mr. President? Yeah, what now? A ball of fire, all-powerful evil speeds across the screen with three Federal Army warships following along behind it as best they can. What do you mean, it's advancing? It's not only advancing, but it's moving at incredible speed. We're having trouble following it. And do you have any idea where it's heading? The scientist is hard to put an answer. He shakes his head. Corbin gently wipes Lilo's forehead with a cloth. She opens her eyes a little. He's gentle and loving. A pupulai. Lilo smiles weakly, feverish. I'm very sad. Why, we did pretty well, wouldn't you say? Five hundred wars, arms, drugs, money. Everything you create is used to destroy. I told you not to read all that crap. Protect life. Until death. Her eyes close. She falls back asleep. Corbin is worried. She seems so depressed. Cornelius enters. There's a general on the phone. His name is Mambo, I think. Monroe here. President Lindbergh wants to talk to you. 
Hold the line. The president clears his throat and takes the phone. Major, first off, I want to thank you, in my name and in the name of the Federation, for the praiseworthy courage you have shown us. I'd like to congratulate General Monroe for his choice. He found the ideal man for such a... Okay, so what's the problem? The president drops into his armchair and sighs. There's a ball of fire 1,200 miles in diameter, heading straight for Earth, and we have no idea how to stop it. That's the problem. Corbin thinks fast. The priest is with him. The five elements are on board. How much time before the collision? The president queries the scientist with a nod of his head. If its speed remains constant, in an hour and fifty-seven minutes. I'll call you back in two hours. Corbin hangs up. The president looks stunned. The ZFX-200 shifts to the speed of light and vanishes in the star-studded cosmos. David is asleep in the chapel. He's woken by the sound of the ZFX-200 that's parked in the middle of the desert. Corbin walks ahead, carrying Lilo. Cornelius has the four stones with him. Barely awake, Loke Rod stumbles along, and David appears at the door of the chapel. You're all safe. Thanks be to God. Later, David, later. There's not a minute to lose. The small group enters the chapel. Cornelius pushes the group onto the altar, which is surrounded by a wooden barrier. Cornelius stands in front of the cross. Excuse me, Father, could we pray later? Cornelius bends the cross and pushes it down. A mechanism is set off, lowering the altar like a service elevator. The altar descends amid rocky walls. They just landed in the desert. The president, sweating. How much time is left? From space, we see Earth. The dark planet fills the screen and heads right for the blue planet. About nine minutes. President Limburg has trouble breathing. Lit by torches, Corbin sets Lilo delicately on the altar in the exact center of the four elements. Cornelius looks over the four stones every which way. Ah, uh, this one must be water. It's obvious he doesn't know where to put it. Don't tell me you don't know how all this works. Theoretically, yes. The four stones form the beam, and the fifth element is supposed to stand in the middle there, but I don't have the reference book. I've never seen the stones work. Corbin can't believe his ears. He tears the stone out of Cornelius's hand and studies the inscription. He goes over to the one of four bases the stones rest on and tries to figure it out. The symbol of air is on the stone, the same as on the base. Match the symbols! Corbin places the first stone and picks up another one. Cornelius has found the symbol for water. Loke Rod sits down. He's very tired. What is this, some kind of game? Like chess? Corbin pulls him to his feet and sticks a stone in his hand. No, it's much simpler. If we don't figure out where these stones go in five minutes, we're all dead. You think you got it? Loke Rod has got it, and runs over to put in his stone. The four stones are all in place, but nothing happens. There's no light. You told me there was supposed to be four beams of light. Cornelius is lost. Yes, of course, but the stones are shut. They have to be open for it to work. And you don't know how they open? Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. The dark planet closes in on Earth rapidly. Corbin leans over Lilo. Lilo, the stones. We have to open them. How does it work? The wind blows. The fire burns. I know all that, Lilo. I'm talking about the stones. The rain falls. Corbin is desperate. Lilo is too weak. He won't get anything more out of her. He darts over to the stone and turns it over and over. The rain falls, the wind blows. Loke Rod stands in front of his stone looking at Corbin. Try and figure out how this fucking thing opens instead of staring at me like that. 
Loke Rod starts feeling the stone all around. I'm looking, I'm looking! The tension is palpable in the president's office. Three minutes. We've lost contact with them. Corbin and Cornelius turn the stones every which way, all to no avail. Loke Rod is discouraged. We'll never make it. He sighs. Three hooks pop off the stone. Loke Rod can't believe his eyes. It moved! Corbin! Corbin, it moved! Corbin rushes over and looks at the stone. The hooks are undone. What did you say? What did you do? Nothing, swear to God, I didn't do nothing. Look, you did something that set it off. Try to remember. Concentrate. Tell me exactly what you did. Loke Rod tries to duplicate the same movement. I was like this with my hands here, and I said, We'll never make it. That's all. Nothing happens. Is that all? Yeah, and then I sighed, like this. <sighs> really depressed this time. The stone opens even more. Corbin understands. The wind! The wind blows! Corbin blows on the stone, which immediately opens, revealing a patch of blue sky, with some miniature clouds floating around inside. A yellow beam pops up like a ray of sunlight, like Corbin's smile. Quickly! Everyone get a stone. Water for water, fire for fire, and earth for earth. The two men move fast. Corbin on the fourth stone, earth. He grabs a fistful of earth and throws it on the stone. A miniature patch of green appears and immediately forms a green beam. Cornelius wipes his forehead with a scarf and rings it over the stone. It opens, revealing a patch of miniature raging sea. A blue beam appears. Loke Rod has a problem. Shaking. I don't have a light. I stopped smoking last week. If we come a bit sooner. Corbin pats his pocket. He comes up with the box of matches. There's only one left. Don't breathe. Loke Rod and Cornelius hold their breath. Corbin strikes the match. A small flame appears on the tip. A breeze goes through the room. Corbin feels like he's got TNT in his hands. He approaches the flame to the stone. The flame twists, dims, and flickers. But it holds on. The stone opens. A patch of miniature fire appears. Corbin sighs and snuffs out the match. The fourth beam, a red one, immediately forms. A mass of fire fills the screen from space. Earth is only a thousand miles away. Two more minutes. The president shuts his eyes. His lips move in prayer. Corbin helps Lilo onto her feet, where the four beams and four colors crisscross. It's up to you now, Angel. I'm so tired. You can sleep tomorrow. Come on. I want to sleep forever. Lilo, listen to me. I'll take you on vacation afterwards, a real vacation this time, for as long as you want. Come on, you can do it. Corbin slowly releases Lilo and steps back from the altar. Lilo can barely stand in the center of the four beams. An indistinct white beam begins to form around her and starts to rise. Come on, Lilo, come on! The beam loses its intensity and Lilo crumples to the floor. The dark planet hurtles toward Earth, a hundred miles before impact. The African continent is visible. The fireball is heading right for Egypt. In the president's office, seconds tick away unrelentlessly on the scientist's stopwatch. It'll be entering the atmosphere in one minute. The heat in the temple is unbearable. All the walls start to ooze, the same horrible black slimy liquid seen at Zorg's. A drop of liquid falls to the temple floor and begins to smoke, eating away like acid. Loke Rod has to dodge another drop of the stuff. Corbin quickly straightens Lilo up and puts her back in the center of the beam. Lilo, if you don't get on with the program, we're all going to die, and that's not on my agenda for today. Lilo wraps her arm around Corbin's neck. What's the use of saving lives when I've seen what you do with them? 
you're right, but there are lots of good things and beautiful things. Like love? Exactly. But I don't know love. I'm like a machine programmed to save other people's lives, but never to have one of my own. The scientist's stopwatch goes from 30 to 29 seconds. I have thousands of memories, but none of them are mine. There's no need for me other than this. I'm immortal, but I have no life. Yes, you do. I need you. More than you can imagine. Stand up straight. Why? Why do you need me? Because... Tell her. Tell her for God's sake. A bit of black acid falls on Loke Rod's shirt, setting it on fire. He rubs it off. Because... Lilo has tears in her eyes. The heat is overpowering, and black acid is everywhere. Tell me... I love you. Despite her fatigue, Lilo smiles broadly. The stopwatch goes from three to two. Now you're allowed to kiss me. Corbin wraps his arms around her and kisses her like he's never kissed anyone before. The white beam, the divine light, immediately forms around Lilo and Corbin. The stopwatch hits zero. The absolute beam explodes from the top of the pyramid and heads straight into the sky, zapping the fireball smack in the middle and slowing it down. Corbin and Lilo kiss like there was no tomorrow. The beam hardens and slowly solidifies the evil planet. Inaudible screeches escape from the dying planet, screeches of terrifying pain as if a million souls were dying. Streams of black acid spurt from the pyramid and solidify like brilliant stalactites. The pure beam, the light of life, has finished its work. The dark planet is nothing more than a dead planet. Strangely enough, it looks like a moon. Everything is calm around it. President Limburg opens his eyes, realizing he's not dead. The planet seems to have stopped at 62 miles from impact. In the temple, the beam loses its intensity, but Lilo and Corbin remain stuck together, lost in the kiss. Cornelius has dropped to his knees, clutching his hands. Loke Rod slips along the wall with a sigh. He gives Cornelius a knowing smile. This guy's a killer with the babes. I knew it from the moment I laid eyes on him. Cornelius and Loke Rod burst out laughing. Corbin and Lilo keep on kissing. We are in the nucleological laboratory that gave birth to Lilo at the beginning of our story. The president enters the lab, followed by a group of officials in ceremonial dress. Mr. President, let me introduce you to Professor Machtelberg, who runs the center. It's an honor to receive you, Mr. President. Beaming. Yes, well, where are our two heroes? They were so tired from their ordeal that we put them in the reactor this morning. I have nineteen more meetings after this one, Professor. Of course, let me see if they've revived. We'll go live in one minute, Mr. President. Machtelberg goes to the reactor and opens a small slot, which allows him to see what's going on under the blue shield. Lilo and Corbin are naked, arms wrapped around each other, kissing, and probably engaged in Hoppy Hopa. Machtelberg looks troubled. Um, they need five more minutes, Mr. President. The President, who's pressed for time, looks over to his aide, who is struggling with a phone call. No, ma'am. I tried. No, ma'am. Who is it? Some woman claims she's Corbin's mother. Give it here. The president takes the phone and goes to the window. Mrs. Dallas, this is the president. On behalf of the entire Federation, I would like to thank you. Don't pull that crap with me. Finger, I recognize that trash voice of yours in a dark alley during a rainstorm. You tell that worthless, no-account son of mine he should plots for the way he's ignored his mother when I think of all I've sacrificed for him. Outside the lab, we see the president through the window, holding the phone away from his ear. 
we pan slowly across Manhattan. The credits roll as two full rising silver moons ascend in the dark blue sky. The end. Make sure that you remembered to subscribe, comment below with suggestions or requests. As always, see you in the next movie reading.